Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Unicus Radio Hour. I'm your host, Robert Stanley. Pleasure to be with you again this evening. I'd like to take a moment and thank all of you who have uh, been kind enough to donate through my website. I really appreciate that. It does take a lot of time and uh, a little bit of money, actually, to, to do this show. Blog Talk Radio is not free. Um, and I also appreciate the folks who are uh, purchasing my books about Washington, D.C. Considering what's going on, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you know that the aliens are involved in the affairs of uh, our so-called leaders there in Washington, D.C. It's, it's really amazing they've been able to cover it up for this long. Uh, I think we're going to get into that a little bit tonight with my special guest is John Kettler. He's the son of a very well-regarded defense engineer. John became a military analyst for Hughes and Rockwell, and uh, he spent over 11 years doing that, covering uh, threats ranging from commando attacks to orbital anti-satellite systems and directed energy weapons. After leaving military aerospace industry, uh, John was a researcher for the Oscar-winning documentary The Panama Deception. He's written dozens of magazine articles on a variety of topics and was interviewed for the Vince Foster political murder documentary called None Dare Call It Murder. Of course, they don't want to call it murder. Uh, he has appeared on numerous radio shows over the years, and he's been kind enough to grace our our airwaves tonight. Um, his interests include military history, exotic technologies, black programs, UFOs, cryptozoology, secret societies, hidden history, and the true powers of the human mind. Hope you're ready for this, folks. John, how are you? Uh, I'm well. Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, I've been reading your uh, your website, your blogs, and uh, it's very interesting information. Um, it, it, there's, I find it difficult. You, you know, it's sort of, uh, it, it's not clear whether where the information is coming from. I, I know you say that some of it is telepathic, and some of it is um, inside government and military sources. Did I get, did I get that right? Uh, I would say yes, and some of it is relayed telepathic information as well. That okay. is to say, other people who have the same sorts of mm, gifts, if you would, mm -hmm. who can communicate interdimensionally via telepathy, who pass information on to me I see. by more conventional means as well. But I do it myself um, to some degree. Uh, some days it actually hurts to do it. It depends on what sort of shape I'm in on any given day. But mm -hmm. uh, when it's working well, it's just like talking to you on the telephone. Well, I understand. I know it's uh, it's easy to dismiss that form of communication because there's you know most people cannot do it or have never experienced it themselves. Mm -hmm. So I can understand where the skepticism would come in. But having experienced it myself and being uh, um, shocked by it every time it happens, uh, I mean. Uh, I, I know, I, I mean, I appreciate why certain people simply would just not accept that. Um, I, I need you to, if possible, uh, speak to uh, speak up a little bit into your phone because I can only boost your signal so much tonight. Not a problem. I can also kick the volume up on the phone. Oh, that would be... Uh, How's you mean, that? Yeah, it's better. That's much better. I appreciate that. Not um, a problem. Okay, yeah, for the, <laughs> for the folks in the audience, uh, there's clearly going to be... Um, Quite a few people live tonight. I, I appreciate the fact that you put my, uh, the link on your website to this show. Uh, I do know that most people listen to this show and many others like this uh, after the fact, just simply as a matter of convenience, which is fine. I can appreciate that as well. People are very busy these days. And ultimately, we're all very distracted, and I think that's by design as well. Um, mm -hmm. You yep. know? And, and you know what really what really bothers me, John, is uh, is the fact that we're so divided on almost every issue. So that's another reason I'm sure that you've encountered resistance with the information that you're providing. Uh, I'm sure you've encountered a lot of people that are uh, well uh, at polar opposites when it comes to their opinions. Uh, yes, I've been called <laughs> crazy. I've been called uh, egomaniacal. I've been called practically every name in the book. Actually, there are many people who are very grateful for what I'm bringing forward, and others who are completely freaked out by it. 
sure. which is why I have explicit warnings on my site and in my e-books about, you know, if you're looking for standard reality, you've come to the wrong place. And, <laughs> you know, you have to be responsible for dealing with the consequences of the information. Right. And don't don't follow it blindly. Feel into it. See how it does or does not sit with you at a gut level. Mm-hmm. See whether it feels right to you. I'm not interested in a bunch of blind followers. Right. This is all more like ripping cataracts off people's <laughs> eyes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we were blinded and hobbled from the very beginning by the uh, the gods, the alien gods that created us recently. And those guys are bad dudes. And I know you talk about that in your blogs. But you also talk about the good guys. And my understanding is that those those guys were also considered gods, and they were here first, and they set up a, uh, a relatively peaceful uh, habitation here, and they upgraded the primitive man that was here to be more like them. And that was going all well and good up until the time that the dark side showed up, destroyed everything, took over, and they and they created their own version of upgraded man here simply to be their workers and slaves. So um, I'm just, I, you know, because you and I have never spoken and I haven't read your books and I don't think you've read mine. So I'm just trying to give you an introduction to my We're perspective. Dead We're what? dead even in that store. <laughs> <laughs> I, di- I did look at some of your background material and okay. whatnot. And uh, so I have at least a nodding acquaintance with it, but no, I certainly haven't read your books. I thought it was very interesting that you raped your own black helicopter. Uh, uh, yeah, to you and me I, both. I've been spared that so far, but there have been plenty of other things done to me. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But it's it's indicative of the dark side. They do everything covertly, and um, uh, I, I think, you know, it, we, we all, everybody who steps into this arena has their own strengths, and to contribute to the to the conflict, and it is a conflict. I, I, oh, absolutely! I, I think you know that, and uh, you know. I see. It, it always surprises me too. I know there's seven billion souls in this world, or give or take. Uh, but I, you know, it's someone um, in in my audience said, you know, you should check out this guy John Kettler, and I was like, I, okay. So I looked at your work, and I found it fascinating. Um, there's so many things I'd like to ask you about. Specifically, though, I, I, what I was taken by was that the the, the situation in Afghanistan uh, where a, 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 an ancient Vimana of one of the gods, right. Zoroaster, mm-hmm. um, you know, this, this is, to me, fascinating based on my research is that, uh, yeah, these guys have been around forever, like I said, uh, as far as we're concerned. And... Um, uh, of course, we're trying to grab their technology and become like them. Uh, it's, it's been an issue all along. I mean, you know, we are genetically related to them, both the good and the bad guys. I mean, I think more the bad guys, obviously, that they've been in control here for thousands of years. And that's why the that's why the secrecy exists. That's why the whole covert nonsense and all the cruelty and corruption, in my opinion, it's all coming from them. But, um, you know, you've been very vocal about the good guys showing up, but and, of course, they're meeting... A lot of resistance, but uh, my understanding is, I'm just wondering what you're taking it on this, is that the good guys actually do outnumber the bad guys, that they've been, they've been studying this situation for a long time, and they had promised to, they promised to return and liberate this world and return it to its natural state, more or less. How does that jive with what you've been told? Uh, well, we haven't really gotten into so much of that. I can mm-hmm. say that... Um, I've been told that there's all kinds of ET genetics seeded across various um, ethnic groupings of humanity. Different uh, star groups were involved with mm-hmm. various you know, groups of humans, the Slavs, the Asiatics, the this, the that, the other. Right. Um, but as far as the liberation force, the reason the liberation force is here is that, first of all, it's been waging war on the reptoids and the greys and the dracos for hundreds of years. Uh, one group had several worlds absolutely destroyed by them, so they're rather browned off over that. Um, of course. 
And, uh, but you mentioned how factionalized we are and not unified and things like that, and that is by deliberate design. And if right. you read the raw material that talks about the power of focused intention, of course, that's the basis of magic and a lot of other things, too. It all depends on how you frame the argument. Right. But what it basically says is that the strength of the choice between service to self and service to others goes by the square of the number so choosing. <laughs> so if you choose service to self, the dark agenda, it becomes, uh, it just reinforces the existing condition because the dark forces have been in control for a very, very long time, and I don't want to shock the listeners <laughs> <laughs> Telling them just how long a very long time is, but uh, suffice it to say, half their standard model of history. Sure. Um, and it didn't but, start here, John. My understanding is it didn't start here. It did come here, but it didn't start here. The conflict didn't start here. That's probably true. That's probably true. Um, but I, you know. My interaction with the liberation forces is much more focused. And these, these kinds of things are sidebar discussions as and when there's time. Mm -hmm. The real focus is on what needs to be done, um, how it needs to be done, what the operational limitations are, uh, getting information to the right people at the right time, that kind of thing. So the other sure. stuff is tidbits and morsels and did you knows and oh by the ways kind of thing that I get. Plus, I get a lot of information fed to me by some people who are able to work in the dimensions even beyond where the liberation forces operate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, you know, you have, you can have in the course of a few days, you can have three major wars fought because their time is not our time. In one dimension, for example, a day on Earth is 30 days in their time. Right. So a lot can happen in that time. And in one case, in a week, there were three wars fought. Wow. Two of which we won and one of which we came off better than the other side. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, a force was dispatched of 25 to 30 reptoid motherships, and they all got killed off in the war. So they never were able to enter this particular arena of conflict. Mm -hmm. So you get into all sorts of strange scenarios, but the old hermetic principle of as above, so below <laughs> is very much true, because if you can't get some of this stuff untangled in the higher dimension, then it is a mare's nest of epic proportions yeah. uh, with dysfunctionality and uh, everything uh, awkward, painful, confusing, frustrating, and I could go on for a week. Yeah, uh, that, That's how screwed up things are in the higher dimensions. People like to think it's all, as one person I know puts it, all warm puppies and fluffy kittens. Uh, no, <laughs> it's not. It's more like enough to keep entire crews of quack psychologists and psychiatrists occupied permanently. Right. That's a more accurate characterization. Um, you know, and people have their various religious models they bring to this, which makes, com makes the discussion both complicated and fraught on top of everything else. Um, the post I did on... Ascension, for example, caused a firestorm. Mm. Uh, so what you wind up with is you have to deal with people's versions of reality. You have to deal with uh, how much your audience can take, your readership can take at any given time. You have to deal with protecting certain information such as the identities and strengths of the liberation forces. Right. Okay? People go, well, why won't you tell us who they are? Because there's a war on. Right. You know? 
Well, why don't you tell us about their planets? Uh, because that gives away specific information that would allow somebody to figure this out. True. Sorry, here, go read this. Um, so you deal with that. You deal with people thinking you're pulling it out of, well, the dark side. Uh, I've been accused of, you know, being under the control of satanic influences. I've been told uh, that I've gone off the deep end. There have been times when I, you know, I keep testing myself going, well, uh, if this is true, then, you know, what about this, what about this, what about this? You know, mm-hmm. you just can't blindly accept the information. And of course not. I'm constantly being beaten on by the readership for proof, which is right. why I was so thrilled when I got that chemtrail shoot down thing and some confirmatory reports of that and the picture that. I put out on the chemtrail post uh, where it shows a whole fleet of chemtrail aircraft executing a maximum G evasive turn. I mean, those aircraft probably had damaged structures mm-hmm. from the, the tightness of the turn they made to get away from what I'm told was, well, it was one of the good guy craft. Mm-hmm. And this was a year ago over Europe. So they were operating long before I became aware of them as a presence. Mm -hmm. Uh, My actual major contact didn't start until I started writing uh, probably December, I guess, of last year when I started doing the YU-55 posts, where you got, we should have been hit by an asteroid, Mm-hmm. about as big as an aircraft carrier. The, the governments of the world were deployed for that. They had a quote-unquote exercise set up, exercise Pacific Wave 11 set up. They were deployed. They didn't bother to warn anybody this was what was coming, but mm-hmm. this was what was coming. And all of a sudden, uh, our attempt to divert the uh, asteroid is contained by something the force of the two megaton atomic blast doesn't reach the asteroid, and the asteroid drastically goes up in its orbit and uh, equally drastically increases its speed and misses Earth cleanly. Wow. Well, it should have come crashing down in the Pacific and caused a reverberating set of tsunamis that would have just demolished the entire Pacific basin, mm-hmm. including the U.S. West Coast. Mm. That's what should have happened. But the extraterrestrials, extra-dimensional ETVDs intervened. Mm. Not just to save us, but because there were sentient beings that the Russians referred to as the cat people in an observation post on the asteroid. The asteroid was originally supposed to go whizzing past Earth in what they call a slingshot maneuver, and then go hurtling back the other direction, basically Mm -hmm. taking advantage of the gravitational forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what you wound up with was an intervention to save both us and another life form. Hmm. And they called them the cat people because the Russians intercepted what sounded to them like cats meowing. (laughs) It's, I'm not. You know, I know it sounds funny, but um, when I worked for Honda Research and Development, that was one of the things that we I came across that we were looking at um, as a way of um, commercializing space. You could actually make a lot of money as well as defend the planet against these these incoming threats. And uh, John Lewis, uh, who works for NASA, had written a book about this uh, called Mining the Sky. And in there, mm-hmm. he shows he shows very clearly that you can actually do this. Um, put an engine on it and uh, build a, a habitat inside there that's actually quite shielded nicely right. in, a, in a way that our space, our current spacecraft are actually a joke. You know, it's uh, it's like getting microwave constantly in a little aluminum tray. <laughs> the, the current spaceships are a joke. <laughs> they really are. So, yeah, we don't know how much life is out there just floating around and, um, or, or, you know, appearing to look like an asteroid, right, that is actually an entire habitat that's mobile. Well, yes. In, in this case, though, this one wasn't fitted with an engine. They oh, that's not good. Built, they, they simply built an outpost on an existing asteroid, as on I it? understand it. On it or in it? Well, 
that's not entirely clear, but suffice it to say, it would say, have to be in it, John. Occupied. Yeah, I would have and to that, say it's, it's got to be in there, John. You know, just like uh, the the moon, uh, Phobos, it's it's hollow. Right. It's probably right. hollow. I mean, more than likely, yeah. it's hollow. It certainly behaves like it is, and it would be a perfect situation. I mean, you know, I'm surprised we haven't done it here. Uh, uh, there's people that say, you know, based on certain evidence, that the moon, our moon is hollow to some degree, yeah. too. Well, you know? there's, there's actually evidence in the literature of a time when we had no moon. Yeah, that's So uh, the moon's yeah. an artificial satellite. One of the, the best... Uh, proof of that that I've seen was a really simple demonstration somebody described where you take a cookie sheet mm-hmm. and you sprinkle some flour on it and you get a bunch of beads and balls and whatnot of various sizes that are, of course, compatible with the cookie sheet. You know, let's mm-hmm. say you have a quarter-inch layer of flour in the cookie sheet. It doesn't matter how big an object you drop into the cookie sheet, it still can only go down so far. And that is my understanding of what we see with the cratering on the moon. You may have a gigantic crater, but it only goes down so far. Mm. So that implies the existence of a much harder interior. And also you have, I forget which Apollo number, so... Uh, I'm sure somebody out there knows. But in one of them, uh, we left a seismometer that, interestingly enough, one of my father's instructors had actually built. He also built a seismometer for Admiral Byrd. His his name was Father Lou Wisely at Spring Hill University. And when the uh, stage that got the lunar module off the moon crashed into it. Uh, Basically, what happened was, the quote was, it rang like a bell for hours. Right. Now, it could only do that if it's substantially hollow, which reinforces this whole thought model we have going. Yeah, and there's photos out there, John, too, of uh, really quite large openings. They say they're lava tubes or whatever, but there's some massive openings that that (laughs) to the interior... I mean, we can't see how deep it goes, but God, these things—these aren't small little holes. They're—they're they're huge, huge. They're not craters either. They're—they're they're very large openings uh, that go straight in. You know, it's not a cave. It—it's it, just an opening that goes straight in below the surface. Right. I haven't seen those myself. Oh, but I, I got I'll send you. It, I'll, it doesn't really surprise me. I'll send you a link. I think you. Yeah. Well. You know, we've got a lot of people that want to talk to you. Um, it's okay, folks, if you want to call in. Sorry if you, if you have to be on hold, but uh, I'll try and get, you know, time flies when we're doing this. So I'm going to try and get through at least a couple of them here and see what, what's going on with the audience. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Whoever's on Skype, who are, can you hear me? I got you on the board now. Hello? Yes, hi. Oh, okay. Did you I have didn't a know question? who you're talking to. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Well, you're... Every, okay, so you called in on Skype, right? No, I have some kind of, you know, cable thing or whatever it is. Oh, okay. Goes internet right. stuff. All right, so did you have a question or comment for John? Yeah, um, I would like to know more about the, uh, um, uh, what was that, the Mossad team assassins that came over and how he knew about it and how he, that, uh, he kind of uh, helped out on that. And, oh, okay. Yeah, well, you remember that? Story, That's kind of like that was real stuff, other than just aliens or so that you really helped out on there. Okay, let's give him a chance to answer. Thanks. Well, in brief, uh, I have very highly placed contacts who have access to information that isn't normally made available to regular law enforcement authorities or anything like that, and I was given a tip that Mossad had brought a hit team in. The particulars of the composition of the hit team were described to me. The uh, fact that they came in by circuitous routes and various other things. And because I'm closely followed in the intelligence community and certain other areas, the information got into the hands rather than being 
so tightly held it was useless, got into the hands of somebody who could do something about it. They went looking for them on the basis of where they thought they'd come in, and they nabbed them at the gate, at the airport gate at Rochester Airport. They were met by two officials, a male and a female, from the State Department's Office of Consular Affairs. Their passports were requested and taken from them. They were handed one-way tickets, I believe, back to Canada. I don't think it was a direct flight to Tel Aviv or anything, and wished a good flight. Well, uh, why were they, they here? Had, pardon? You say, why were they here, John? I'm sorry, I didn't read that, that post. Oh, oh, they were here to, it was believed they were here to kill a Middle Eastern man who was a suspected terrorist. Oh, I see. Now, whether he was or he wasn't didn't really matter to the U.S. Our policy is we don't want people conducting hits on our turf. Right. Well, unless they're so, sanctioned by us, right? <laughs> pardon? Unless they're sanctioned by us. Well, but no, we don't. Uh, we don't want foreign powers. Oh, uh, yes, I see what you're saying. Yes, uh, even if it's in our benefit, yeah, we don't. It, it could get very messy. Yes, exactly. You know, especially if somebody's not using something that's surgical. Uh, and if you look at the history of Israeli assassination, sometimes they've been very messy, like a VW Rabbit stuffed full of high explosives. Mm. Uh, you really don't want things like that happening in your country. So basically what happened was I got the information. The, the information was deliberately provided to me. Uh, I put the information out there. It got into the hands of somebody who could do something about it timely. And mm -hmm. so the hit team was intercepted before it could carry out the hit. Well, that's good. Unlike what happened to Vince Foster, so did you have some insider information about that? Is that why you worked on a documentary? I actually went out with a friend of mine and uh, walked the ground and discovered that uh, the story that was being put out in the news and the actual what we call the ground truth, what there on the ground didn't track at all. You mean at so, Fort Mar you talking about Fort Marcy Park? Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the events as described, and it's been a long time, and I don't remember the details, but uh, they didn't match up even remotely. They, sure. the, the public was told a big fat set of lies about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Foster, from the forensic evidence, was clearly killed somewhere, rolled up in a carpet and moved. Right. Uh, the terrain, as described in Fort Marcy Park, didn't match, I know, because we went out there and we walked it mm -hmm. in the summertime in D.C., and we took some pictures, too, uh, as I recall. So it just didn't track. It didn't track, and, you know, when his computer conveniently left off the desk, smashing the hard drive. Yeah, right. Yeah. So... Um, you know that that's the, the the short version of how I wound up on that. Um, I see. Well, you've also written that um, the Navy acquired some uh, alien technology back in was the early 1930s out there in front of San Diego. So that yes, was I that have. was. Go ahead. Uh, that is why the Navy is the senior surface in UFOs. Um, I'm going to guarantee I get the date right, but I want to say 33. A craft was observed in trouble. It was streaming black smoke. Mm -hmm. It came down practically alongside an old cruiser, my guess, of Spanish-American War, because if it was World War I vintage cruiser, you know, calling a warship that's 10 years old ancient is not really right. So, yeah. Uh, Whereas you're talking the difference between night and day, if you're talking about a coal-fired Spanish-American war vessel versus what we had even in World War One, mm -hmm. so they were the hatch popped open. Uh, the occupants were pretty cooked apparently, but they were able to get the craft aboard before it flooded and sank, and the Navy took it 
uh, ashore near San Diego. I haven't really written the full story on this yet, but they took it to a field near San Diego and proceeded to work on it, and eventually Tess flew it in the 50s, and I'm going to keep the rest of that for a post. But that is how the U.S., um, in terms of organizationally, got into the UFO stuff from a technology basis. Right. Um, And so you wind up with the bizarre situation of the U.S. Navy operating Area 51 for the Air Force. I confess when one of my contacts asked me, you know, who runs Area 51, and I came back with the U.S. Air Force and found out it was the Navy, I was dumbfounded. Yes. But the Navy is the senior service when it comes to UFO matters. That's just how it is. The Navy got there first and mm-hmm. therefore has the the top seat. Well, they're much older than a much older branch too than the Air Force. And Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. And the UFO phenomena actually is intimately linked to what some people call the underwater submersible objects. Um they've been around uh, <laughs> As long as we've been seeing things in the sky, sailors have been seeing things in the ocean or coming and leave, coming into and going out of the ocean, and they're still seeing this stuff. There's a fact, oh yeah, yeah. Well, Columbus, you, go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say Columbus reported yeah. something like that. There was a luminescent circular object seen by him on his voyage of so-called discovery. Um, you know, in the 1950s, the Navy was running an anti-submarine exercise uh, off in the Bahamas at a place what they call AUTEC, uh, Atlantic Underwater Test and Evaluation Center, I believe is the right uh, explanation for the acronym. And they're out there playing Hunt the Sub, and along comes something making 200 knots, and it went right underneath the task force and kept going. Right. Well, you know, 40 knots was probably the top speed anything in the Navy could make that sailed on the ocean. At the right, Not un- and let alone under yeah. it. Yeah, I know. Discounting PT boats, you know. <laughs> um, right. So that really got people's attention. And, you know, the classic work on that is Ivan Sanderson's uh, mm-hmm. USO's underwater submerged objects. More recently, in the Baltic, they found one, and uh, apparently it's quite good size, and it left one heck of a gouge, like a half mile long gouge on the bottom of the Baltic. Right, right. And nearby in the North Sea, there's a whole story behind the the guy, uh, Captain Robert uh, McDonald, he sailing um, out of Norway, encountering a uh, UFO there, and getting into a whole lot of mess of uh, trouble. Uh, we got, you know, here's the thing. Folks in the audience, you know, if you're calling in to ask a question, you've got to hold more than a minute because it takes a minute. It takes a while for me to get to you. I see I see a lot of people calling in wanting to ask a question and then dropping off after a couple minutes. Just try, <laughs> try and be patient here because there's a lot of people on the board and, and I'm trying to set things up here with John. So if you can just hold on and be patient. I'll, let's take another call here. Area code, area code 281, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All righty. Did you have a question or comment for John? Um, what I wanted, I have a comment. All right. I can barely understand the word he's saying. He needs to talk louder, and I so see. do you. I see. The audio well, is very poor. Okay, I understand, ma'am. Thank you. All right, my volume's up all the way. You know, John, here's the thing. It's just like what what people need to realize is that somebody's messing with the system tonight. Uh, when I when I first called John, I couldn't hear him, and uh, and then it was like somebody just pressed a button and suddenly we were able to communicate. So there is interference tonight. I kind of figured that would be the case uh, because we're talking about sensitive subjects, and I don't think we've even got that deep yet. But uh, somebody's really unhappy about the fact that we're having a conversation publicly 
Oh, I'm sure. I mean, if my private communications are interfered with, I'm not at all surprised this would happen. Similar things happened when other people tried to do uh, programs like uh, Greer doing the the, uh, Project Disclosure stuff. That whole Mm. Internet live feed was jammed 17 ways from Sunday. Um, I have calls drop all the time when I'm talking to my contacts. it takes sometimes five five attempts to get an email through to people. From, you know, so we're used to it. Sure. Yeah, and I'm I'm also hearing a delay tonight that I usually never ever get. So, yeah, life's getting real interesting here. Um, let's take some more calls with uh, area code area code seven one four. Is this Ken? Hey, brother Bob, what's up, dude? <laughs> Not much, not much. We're just always watching, to, always listening. Yeah, just, yeah, just shaking the tree, boss. So, did you I have, brother? Did you have a question or comment for John? Yeah, John, uh, uh, really good to hear what you're having to say. Um, I don't know if you're aware. On four twenty two two thousand eleven, there is a uh, shutdown of all the uh, uh, all the uh, flyovers with the uh, chemtrail. Did you know that? Anything about that? Oh, well, was it shut down of all of them? No. Yeah, they shut down. That. Yeah, it was for like uh, four months. They shut down. 4-22-2011, uh, we had uh, quite a few groups praying in unison to uh, to bring light to this world. And so for like four months, I believe, there was no chemtrail spraying, at least for sure in the United States alone, uh, for about four months. I uh, wanted to confirm that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to look into that. Um, okay, so um, what are you talking about? Are you talking about a focused intention group shut down the chemtrails? Is that what you're saying? I think we had a little help from outside and inside. I think it was a dual like partnership to uh, to shift things. So oh, it was okay. called up. No, it was called- I, ha- I haven't heard anything about that, but you know, I didn't have my blog up until basically November of 2011. So that was well after that. It was called Operation, it was called Operation Lightsaber. <laughs> I, will, I will look into it. I'm not familiar with it. Well, one of the, one of the things I, I saw is there were two world ships that showed up next to this planet. They were cloaked, and they showed up. This is what I saw in a vision, right? And they were the builders, okay? And this is what they said. They said, we are here now. And more of us are coming. And telling the evil guys around this planet, the ETs, the humans, whoever, the hybrids, whatever, said, your time is up. We're coming back. We're shutting everything down, taking all your technology. Everything that harms this planet will be taken off here. And the laws of the creation of God Almighty, the creator of all, will be brought back to this planet. You, your time is up, period. So... I went, wow. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty heavy. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, I hadn't heard that, but there certainly are forces here, and they are doing um, considerable damage to the dark forces that are here, and what they've done is, is nothing compared to what they're getting ready to do. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, going back to the moon, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, originally what I was shown is that was a reptilian uh, ship that was destroyed in the battle of Mars about two or 300,000 years ago. I don't know if that's true or not, but there's, uh, and that's why I want I don't that. know, but yeah. it seems like another know. thing worth looking into. There was, there was a few years ago then everybody on this planet wanted to go to the moon, then all of a sudden it stopped. I don't know if you remember that. That Japan was yeah. there, you know, everybody yeah. wanted to go there, and then all of a sudden it just shut down. No one said a word after that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, there's um, a very good reason for that. We were disinvited. <laughs> there, there, there's a great quote I saw in a book where here we are in our little lunar module feeling all proud of ourselves, and we look across the crater, and on the other side there's a giant saucer. Exactly. And the quote that got out and was heard by a bunch of ham operators before NASA managed to squelch it was, 
these babies are huge. Yeah. Monstrous. Miles in diameter, yeah. You know, uh, uh, I, I commend hmm. to you Ingo Swan's piece on Bibliotheca Pleiades dot net, uh, where he talks about mental telepathy and ETVDs, and he'll give you quite the rundown on the moon and what was going on on the moon. And there definitely were alien bases on the moon, and hmm. they were mining things and doing all kinds of stuff. So yeah. we were pointedly invited to not to leave and not come back. Right. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, there, uh, uh, pretty soon, a few months, there's going to be a, a movie coming out called Battleship. And uh, it's, I think it, I think it throw, throws a clip in there about reptilians. That'd be huh. funny. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I know May, they just May May have the premiere. What? I said, I know they just had a premiere for Battleship because I happened to see something when I opened my Yahoo page or some mm. starlet who was in Tokyo for the opening of it and said right. Battleship, mm -hmm. and I had no idea what it was about. Yeah, these reptilians are in these suits that they're protected, but eventually they take one off and they find one in there. But you know uh, how, how badass reptilians are, how badass predators, right? Yeah. Well, reptilians are worse, okay? They, they hunt predator, right? But... Here's the good thing, is that the builders scare the hell of these guys. When the builders show up, the reptilians, they could be like like 100 starships out there. When the builders show up, these guys just leave. <laughs> they just go. They don't want to mess with them. So, well, they, they've got a problem right now, and that <laughs> anything that tries to leave is destroyed. Anything that that's, tries to come in is destroyed. So, that's what um, I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking payment. about. All right, Ken. Thank you so much. <laughs> God bless you guys. Take care. Bless you. See ya. Yeah, uh, Ken's been telling me about this stuff for a long time, and uh, it, a lot of it's parallel to what you've written on your post about things disappearing, you know, um, and and even people, too. I thought that was pretty in, intense, some of what you were writing about uh, operatives being taken out. Well, uh, let me clarify that. They had decided to kill themselves. They were, shall we say, guided as to where to do it best. They had already made the decision to kill themselves, but by having them do it where they did it, it uh, provided a psychological effect that was out of all proportion to the numbers. Hmm. Okay. I happen to have been to Central Intelligence Agency, and if you go in by a certain route, They've got the trees all rigged to talk to you, and they've got hidden cameras and everything. Now, imagine you're driving into work, and you find somebody hanging from his tie in the trees right on the main approach route to your job. Right. This is going to have an effect, and it did have an effect. It, they battened down the hatches big time over there, and they still haven't unbattened them. Hmm. It wow. traumatized the whole organization. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty heavy-duty message to be sending. Yeah, and I fully expect there will be more in other places. I'm frankly surprised there haven't been more in other places. Right. Maybe they're just not being covered. Yeah, uh, well, most everything's not being covered. I, I know you, you wrote a very good article about that as well, the censorship that's going on. <laughs> The censorship that goes on in this world is, is phenomenal. But, you know, what we were saying before, this is a battle zone, and uh, typically the first casualty of war is always the truth. Well, that's absolutely true. Unfortunately. That is true. And that is why there's an effort underway to break the control of the media. There have already been yeah. some significant cracks. When you've got the likes of Rush Limbaugh talking about giant skeletons, and uh, what else was the other thing he was talking about? And then you have Anderson Cooper and his guy in the field being caught fabricating news coverage. Yeah. And a couple of other things that have happened. The cracks are already quite visible in the facade of the mainstream media. 
Yeah, I, I think most of those... Of, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, the kind of thing that we see happening in the banking is going to happen in the mainstream media. I mean, mm-hmm. Murdoch's resigned. His organization's in big trouble for, among other things, uh phone tapping the royals and whatnot, um, <laughs> and a lot of other people, right. uh, and there will be more of that. But if you look at the resignation list and whatnot, I think it's in excess of 500 in the heavy-duty banking and financial circles. Right. You will probably see something like that happen, and I think you probably will see some people from the mass media disappear. I personally think it'd be great if the oh, absolutely. CCDB smashed people right off their desks yeah. you know, before yeah. they could even hit the kill switch. You know, or, you know, I've counseled making sure the kill switch doesn't work so, <laughs> you know, or broadcast delay circuit so that it goes out to the world. Yeah. 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 But I think this is what we have to look forward to because until control of the mass media is broken, the people by and large will not have the level of awareness they need and will not, in many cases, believe things. They're so conditioned to getting their information from the mainstream news, but right. the mainstream news is falling apart. Uh, viewership for CNN, according to one study I saw, is down by half. Wow. And I think it's tracking roughly that way elsewhere. So where are people getting their information? Well, from Uh, us, for example. Yeah. Yeah, the Internet, definitely. Yeah, the Internet kind of took over everything um, as far as information is concerned. Let's, Let's take one more call here and see what happens. Area code 250, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Gentlemen, how are you? Very well, how are you? John, really an honor. Thank you. Um, You've just spoken of the resignations, and uh, I was just wondering when it comes down to the bottom line, when the arrests are made through uh, various uh, means and resources, what makes people think that these arrests that are being made are the real people, the real culprits behind the uh, type of uh, chaos that we are faced with. So in other words, how can we be sure that these banking people or from greater organizations are not really clones Hmm. that we are arresting? Uh, Well, uh, the short answer is initially we couldn't, and that's what we got was a whole bunch of clones. But Mm. clones have to know where to go to get recharged, and so um, that little problem was corrected later on. And with the head of the organization removed, if you would, the thing has been disintegrating progressively ever since. Now, my understanding is that... uh, Groups from what's called the Universities of Evolution, which I've written about on my blog, um, johnketler.com, have come in. They are financial experts, and they're working very, very hard to untangle this mess. Uh, They were oscillating for a while between optimism and black despair because it was such a hairy mess, but... They think they can sort it out now. And so this is what the invisible force is, if you would, driving this cascading series of resignations. Uh, as far as arresting people, I think there's a, there have been some arrests, and they've been reported in what are considered to be credible sources. But there's a lot of what I would characterize as wishful thinking going on out there, and some of these uh, machine intelligence, artificial intelligences that broadcast either from gigantic spacecraft or mind control operations run out of the CIA uh, 
are painting a picture which basically says all this great stuff is happening, you don't need to lift a finger, which is the exact opposite of the truth. Right. The truth is everybody can and should be doing something Mm -hmm. to help the process. You know, everybody can contribute something. Everybody's got a certain talent or an ability or a contact or something. Right. Okay, so a lot of these reports of imminent arrest make me want to gag, quite frankly, Mm. because they're creating a false hope, and I think that's their real purpose. Yes, a sense of apathy, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, it's all being taken care of. You know, you don't have to get off your butt and do something. Well, you do. Right. Yes. Uh, Caller, caller, I hear something in the background. Are you listening to us on your computer as well? Yes, I am. Is it is the audio quality all right? Uh, no, it's uh, it's very poor. And I'm uh, from uh, British Columbia, Canada. Okay, all right. So, all right, somebody's messing with the system tonight. Yeah, That's... well, we don't have to guess very far with that, do we? <laughs> right, did you have any other comments or questions? Uh, yes, um, I just want to make a comment that uh, I do a lot of astral projection, and I know for a fact there's a lot of war happening over there, and uh, it seems that there's a lot of us involved in the higher dimensions, uh, specifically in the fourth, trying to curb this whole um, chaos uh, into uh, in a somewhat uh, much more orderly fashion. So. Uh, Yes, it's uh, it's still going on very, very strong, and I know from myself, from experience in the astral realms, that I generally wake up more tired than I am when I'm going to sleep. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, the battle uh, I know that it's... feeling all too well. Yeah. You go to bed tired, and you wake up feeling even worse. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very, t- uh, very much, gentlemen. Uh, take care, and uh, the best to both of you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. All right. Uh, let's see if I try this one. Um, area code 707. Can you hear us? I'm 707. Yes. Uh, yeah, I had a question for John. Go ahead. Um, John, it's it's wonderful to talk to you, and I admire your bravery and think you're one of our great heroes. I My question is, is and, and just kind of... Um, um, on the on what you had just said, um, the the conversation or interview with Drake, with Dave Wilcock, um, mm-hmm. would you would you put that in the category of wishful thinking, or is that something different? Well, okay, I keep getting comments, and I get forty plus comments a day on the site. Um, People keep talking about it, but I'm so busy, I haven't had time to look into it in detail. But I've certainly seen enough of it to get the gist of it. And the gist of it appears to be that Drake is saying that imminent action by the military to deal with this whole out-of-control gutting of the constitutional fish is about to occur. And I've got phenomenal contacts and uh, I'm not hearing it Mm. I'm just not hearing it now if people are in a position to cut my contacts out of the loop I'm really impressed Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm just not hearing it so I have a very real concern that this is more of this uh, feel good ism if you would Mm -hmm. okay um He might be right. He might be right. It would be nice to think he's right. Yeah. But I can't afford to just go, okay, yeah, this is great, this is fabulous. And I've had this battle going on with some of my readers for weeks now Mm -hmm. over this. And they come in with this person and that person and this (laughs) channel report and something else, and it's like, you know, you talk about giving somebody a migraine, and I don't even get them. But the headaches are nonetheless impressive. Yeah, it's because called the fog of war, John. The fog of pardon? war. Yes, the fog of war. Well, people want to believe certain things. Of course. Okay, they've been trained to believe certain things. They're being propagandized to believe certain things. Mm-hmm. 
They're, they've been under the yoke. They're screaming for relief and release. They're screaming for proof that the ETVDs are doing something. And occasionally I'm able to provide some. Mm-hmm. But is it possible that Drake is right? Yes, it's possible Drake is right. Do I consider it likely that Drake is right? No, I do not. Okay. Does that answer my contact? Go ahead. No, you go ahead, John. Uh, all I was going to say is my contacts are extensive enough and well placed enough that if something like that were in the wind, I think I would hear about it because you'd be amazed the things I hear about. <laughs> Yes. Well, you, you probably are aware that uh, Ben Fulford the following day mentioned something of a 72-hour um, um, situation where people need to have food and, and that kind of thing in case um, there is uh, mass arrest. So Ben Fulford also came up with, with that comment as well. Yeah, but, you know, they work together, those two. and they um, do. You know, so so what? Okay. You know, here's the thing, caller. I say be in well informed, but you know you can't believe everything you hear or read. Mm-hmm. And and so use some discernment. I I mean I'm in the same boat as you. I think we all are actually in the same boat in this regard, where it's very difficult to to discern what is truth and what is f- fiction. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, the only reason I brought that up is because I thought perhaps his contacts were different than. Uh, Dave Wilcock, but yeah, I do know that they talk <laughs> no. a lot together. A lot, a lot, yes, and so oh, I, I, I'm sure you know. And Fulford's got impressive credentials on the one hand, mm-hmm. and seems to have some very interesting contacts. But on any given pronouncement by Fulford, he may be, to use a baseball analogy, right over the plate, or he may be out somewhere in the parking lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that he seems to be all over the place in terms of the quality and accuracy of the information he's putting out. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know why that is, but this is not just my opinion, but it's the opinion of the ETVD, and it's the opinion of my very highly placed contacts. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. one of them said the other day, and I quote, Fulford's full of it. <laughs> Unquote. That's scary regarding specifically the uh, tsunami scenario with Japan. He's talking about... um, Yeah, the underwater nuke. Yeah, the two-megaton nuke or whatever. Well, you know, a two-megaton nuke is um, roughly the equivalent of a little over a magnitude six quake. Okay, now... That's two megatons. And we're talking about uh, a 9.1 or whatever, allegedly. Well, John, John, he... 45 gigatons. Yes, I know, but he wasn't saying, in all fairness, he wasn't saying that it was the nuclear bomb that caused the earthquake directly. It was indirectly triggered the movement on a place that was unstable already. It's sort of like you throw a stick of dynamite and you cause an avalanche. Right. Okay. Well, that's, if, that's if you've all got a preload. I'm, I, I've seen a little bit on this. The idea of a preloaded fault and yeah. some use of harp and yeah. some charges and whatnot. But I'm just saying that I understand. In and of itself, a two megaton bomb is not going to get you to 45 gigatons or 45 billion tons of nuclear yield equivalent. That's Way, yeah. way, 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 way beyond <laughs> all the combined nuclear arsenals on the planet. Yes, I understand. All right, caller, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. You're welcome. Okay, let's see if we get another one. Did, hopefully the board's working a little better. I tried adjusting my level here. Um, area code 508, you're welcome to come in to have a conversation. Yes, can you hear me? I got you loud I'm and clear. Here. I'm in on Skype. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. And, uh, John, this is Alexander Smart calling in. Oh, uh, hello. Hello there. I'm glad to finally talk to you, and I've enjoyed your interviews with uh, Carrie Cassidy. Um, today, I, oh, I've been spending some time uh, digging into these 
so-called natural disasters, including uh, Fukushima. Mm -hmm. But I went back uh, to uh, the BP oil rig uh, event mm -hmm. and uncovered a, a little nugget that maybe is old news to people. I don't know, because I feel like I'm coming into the game late here. Uh, and uh, what I uncovered with the help of uh, Jim Stone uh, is a... Uh, eyewitness testimony uh, to the fact that uh, people who were fishing uh, not far from the oil rig, maybe 100 yards, uh, bore eyewitness testimony. Uh, there's a write-up you can look at, and uh, they uh, all of a sudden noticed that the power went down on the rig, that all the lights went off. And uh, then they heard uh, an explosion. Now, these electrical circuits on the rig, I'm told, I don't know personally, are heavily shielded and protected. Uh, but then, uh, they, after the boom, they were looking up. They saw a big blue purplish beam uh, going up into the sky. Really? And, yes. And... Uh, I had been looking for uh, deliberate uh, man-made assistance to this event, and I've heard other rumors, of course, about other, it may, may have been more than one causal uh, item, but uh, this, again, uh, pretty much, and I saw the video, they even took a video, and in fact, it looked uh, like some kind of a laser beam a huge laser beam. Hmm. So that's one thing. And it then... Uh, that, uh, I'm definitely going to follow up on this. I sent you an email, John. Uh, I don't think... I th I'm, I'll have to review what I sent you, but there is a video that goes along with it, and uh, uh, Jim Stone found this a long time ago and then had discounted it as being a fake. But right. he, men he mentioned it in his interview with Kerry Cassidy, and it immediately caught my attention. So I went back to him and said, hey, you know, uh, could you tell me more about And uh, Between the two of us, I was able to locate this on the net. And um, the other thing that was interesting is uh, the connection with Judy Wood's work, excellent work, uh, she shows uh, photos, uh, aerial photos, looking down into uh, the rubble of the buildings, and you can quite clearly see circular cuts. I mean, they look like circles. It looks like somebody took a circular uh, die or, and cut into the base of these where the buildings once were. You mean at Fukushima? No, at the, uh, I'm sorry, World Trade Center. Oh, World I, I was going to say, uh, you know, are we talking the oil rig? It sounded like you were talking 9-11. Yeah, well, I was talking the oil rig, but then the connection with the oil rig, uh, mm -hmm. I got a, an aerial view of the helipad on the oil rig. Mm -hmm. And there is a sort of, sort of a rectangular, large rectangular hole cut through the uh, Gila platform, uh, which doesn't appear to have been subject to any fire because it hangs out over the ocean. Right. And, but what I noticed going in closer, at one end of this huge rectangular cut, actually not a rectangle, but at one end there's a nice, beautifully curved part of a circular cut at one end, which looks just like the cuts that Judy Wood showed uh, looking down into the World Trade Center remnants. Okay. So I just wanted to bring those little tidbits up. Uh, I apologize if it's old news to anyone, but I've, uh, I'm sort of a giant come lately. No, it, it, it's not um, old news to me, certainly. Um, I should point out to the listeners that Alexander Smart is one of the uh, frequent commenters on my site, too. Uh, so I know 
who he is from his many comments. Um, I try not to comment too often because there's a lot of blathering. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there, there, there is that, and I find myself repeating myself a lot, which is why I started building an extensive fact on the site so that I didn't have to keep rewriting the same answer. Of course. Yeah. But it's my it's my understanding from my contacts you know, here on Earth, that uh, they have tried building something over and over and over again on the site of the World Trade Center, and any time they put a structure up, it crumbles away to nothing in very short order. They just can't do it. Hmm. And my understanding from the ETZDs was this is a device we should never have had. It's called a molecular disruptor. And in some manner that has yet to be explained to me, setting the thing off has caused it to run open loop. It's still running, in other words. Uh, yes, so I've, I've heard that. Force, yeah, so the same force that pulverized the concrete and steel of the World Trade Center is still at work. It's still radiating upward. Now, my understanding is that some containment measures have been put into place, but we may have to suffer through with that one for a while as an object lesson in not doing stupid human tricks. <laughs> well, playing with technologies we have no business playing with. Yes. So are you saying so that the device is, was under the ground, John? John, did you, are you saying that that device was, is, or was under the ground? There, I think so. Well, uh, I don't. I, I don't no. really know for sure, but the the I think you know, that would have to be the case in order for the phenomenon to be working the way it's been observed to work. They can't build any structure right. over where the World Trade Center was because it just disintegrates. Yeah, I hear you, and but you know, it could be it could be a latent resonant field that's from it. I mean. My understanding is that you could beam that that kind of energy down from a uh, they call a platform, you know, right. orbital platform could actually contain an, an energy source and a weapon that is uh, tunable. Um, not saying that's the way it is, folks. I'm just saying I'm you know I'm thinking out loud based on some of the technology that I've studied. I mean, even Tesla when he was in New York, he created a small device that um, it resonated. And and when he placed it against the wall of the building, the whole damn building came down. It was in, like an yeah. artificial earthquake. What? Clamped it to the frame. That was that was yeah. based on resonance. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was a mechanical resonator. Right. But you but can he also scared it so badly he destroyed the plans to it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. But uh, well, that we know of, uh, we we really don't know what the government <laughs> confiscated from him when he was uh, more run down in the street there. Um, well, it, it looks like ahead. Judy Wood's hypothesis of a molecular disassociation device yeah. uh, is correct. Uh, she won't say any more than that, and that's she's been very careful scientifically uh, not to jump to any assumptions. But all <clears throat> that dust, she believes, was created by molecular disassociation, wow. and. Uh, that may that device, whatever it is, may have left a residual, you know, like residual radiation. Yes, nuclear radiation <laughs> yeah. may right. have created well, some residual device uh, <laughs> radiation or resonance or whatever you want to call it. You know, I did see something about this a while back, and and they were attributing that same kind of beam from the sky to the uh, uh, spontaneous combustion of vehicles in the area. Yes, uh, she relates it to that, that somehow uh, the the beam, if that's what it is, mm -hmm. uh, may, you know, maybe they did that uh, to distract people, you know, who knows, mm -hmm. whatever, whoever did it. And right. uh, so, but yes, that, that could, it could be another residual effect of shutting down the device. Maybe it, maybe as you shut it down, the beam greatly widens or something as the uh, energy level goes down. Uh, okay. uh, that's just total hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways, uh, uh, thank you for uh, 
letting me join in your conversation. Our pleasure, Alexander. Take care. Good night, good night, John. Good night, Robert. Good night. Good night, Alexander. Okay. And let's see. Well, the, the board is going bonkers right now. It really is weird tonight. Well, that's a good sign. We're not boring them to death. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, let's see if I – there's a area code 707, another area code 707. Can you Can you hear me? Hello. Come on in. How's it going? Good. How are you? Pretty well. Good, uh, good to be on the air with you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your work to uh, for humanity. Hmm. Uh, question to John. You had yeah. mentioned in a recent blog about the uh, the Warburgs who had left to go, uh, who had left the planet to go to the um, the School of Evolution, I believe. I'm wondering if uh, is that ahead. true? Well. What they got originally were clones, and I wouldn't have to say I'm current on what the status of the Warburgs. I believe what happened was once they realized they got clones, they went back and they got the real ones, and mm-hmm. uh, that, and they subsequently wound uh, rounded up a lot of the kingpins of international banking. But as for specifics on that, I don't really have any. Finance is very peripheral to what I'm doing and what I'm involved in, and it's not really my strong suit to begin with. I don't, I'm no international econ doctorate or anything like that. So uh, that was information that was passed to me, and I mean, since the move was made against the international banksters, as many like to call them. Mm. You've seen massive, massive changes in the you know, financial pyramid, if you would. Mm-hmm. And those are just now starting to manifest in the the lower tiers. But when you have that many resignations there's definitely something going on. And the something going on is that the, as I understand it, basically the reptoids that were at the top of the whole pyramid have been displaced and that they form the power base for the others. And so there's just been this crumbling of the thing from the top down. And now new leadership has been brought in from the universities of evolution and things are getting sorted out, and a new and more just system is being developed. But as to the particulars beyond that, I really couldn't say because I don't know. Haven't oh, I see. Involved. I wasn't aware that they uh, they had sent up clones. I was wondering if uh, any any other of the elite families had come to the light and realized that they that they no longer belong here, but uh, uh, apparently not. Uh, well, I think a whole bunch of them have been quietly grabbed is what I think has happened, but I don't know directly. Okay. Just it's, well. gonna t- it's gonna take a while for any of us to get the whole the bigger picture on this. Right. Uh, you know, and again the fog of war and obviously you can't rely on the mainstream media to tell you anything truthfully. Sure. Um so we're doing the best we can, struggling along here, but you know, I do think that uh when when we finally do start getting some answers that can be verified, it's going to be shocking. I mean, some people are actually going to simply just have heart attacks because it'll be such a, a devastating blow to their paradigm. Exactly. You know, and that's one of the reasons that I think that I, myself, and Don will persevere in the face of adversity because we are trying to prepare uh, people for, you know, to at least begin thinking in these along these terms uh, in ways that they can, are, are you know, semi comfortable with. You know, in other words, acclimate them now so that they don't have such a shock to their to their psyche that they just they just freak out, fall right. apart. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both very much for your work. My awesome. pleasure. Take care. Good night. All right, John. Let me take a really quick uh, commercial break. I'll be back in two minutes here. Mm-hmm. Thank you. By the way, uh, John's website is very interesting, johnkettler.com. I suggest you go and take a look there. And and uh, 
I haven't updated that commercial in quite a while, unfortunately. Um, I do have a second book out called Covert Encounters in Washington, D.C. You can purchase it at Amazon.com, either as a print book or uh, uh, for Kindle. And um, if you really want to know what's going on in Washington, D.C., you have to read my books. I'm sorry to say there isn't anybody else that has done the investigative journalism on the hidden history of the nation's capital and how that relates to extraterrestrials, the negatives uh, that are here, and uh, the agendas that they're playing out on our world. John, we're back. Yep. Yeah, so... (laughs) Your book sounds fascinating. Well, it's not something I intended to write. Um, As you saw when you looked at those pictures on the website, I, I only published one article internationally on the internet and also in Nexus magazine, which is uh, it's out of Australia, but it's published in a lot of different countries. I'm, I know you're probably familiar with it, but um, oh, yeah. yeah, Duncan's a good friend of mine, so he he agreed to publish the pictures with a, a brief article that I wrote about how I I had stumbled onto this thing and you know authenticated these negatives that this individual took and who he was and you know how this you know the backstory to the photos. Um, <laughs> That's how come I was visited by the black helicopter. And, uh, uh. Yeah, well, it's because, in, well, because in part of doing the investigation for the article, I called the the, the yeah, Capitol Police, uh, and I and I inquired some things from them because uh, they were um, the photographer who took those pictures, who was just there that night doing a photo shoot, uh, inadvertently captured all the, these images of the UFOs around and even landing on the Capitol building, which I thought was bizarre, but okay. Uh, so I contacted them because he said, the photographer said he had given a, a copies of, of his photographs to the Capitol Police Detective Division. So I was trying to verify that. Well, going in the front door at the U.S. Capitol with the Capitol Police gets you basically nowhere. Uh, I mean, they did answer my questions eventually. Once a supervisor, it had to be uh, approved. They couldn't just, the public relations officer couldn't just answer my questions straight up. Um, you know, so they did this song and dance, and then they came back with this whole plausible deniability like routine. And but the the here's how they knew where I was is because not only was I calling them, they said, "Well, who are you? Uh, what are you doing?" And I said, "You know, I told them I'm writing this article, and I wanted to give them a chance to, you know, to comment on the record." I said, "We've got the photos of them landing on the Capitol." I said, "I know that sounds outrageous, but I mean, we have the we have negatives." You know they've been analyzed and they're and and they're authentic. So we, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to comment because it's happened on your watch, you know. And <laughs> you, you know, so the guy was completely baffled. He says, "I got to talk to my supervisor." I get back. He says, "But who are you?" You know. And I said, "I said, well, I'm a freelance journalist. I'm doing this thing." He says, well, "And what are you going to do with this?" And I said, "I'm well. I'm planning on publishing it." And he goes, "Where?" And, you know. And when, you know, so he's asking me all these things. Of course, now that was passed on up the food chain. Uh, God knows how far it went. But, you know, as soon as, I mean, I'm not kidding, about a week after that, I broke that story, that's when I got the visit from the helicopter. And um, they they didn't just fly over the house, John. They came to my house. They flew around the house. And it was they were flying so low, it shook the entire house. And... Uh, yeah, well, I, but I, yeah, but see, I, I wasn't sure if those things were real or not until I actually saw one face to face. I kind of thought people were making it up or misidentifying things, or you know what I mean. I, it just uh, personally, I didn't know for sure if they even existed. Um, right. But but so it comes to my house, and so I run outside to see what's going on, and inst- now they instead of circling, they they were hovering over the driveway. I mean, literally, like, 100 feet up in the air. I could have hit them with, if I picked up a rock or something, which would have been stupid, but I, I literally could have chucked a rock at them. They were that low in the sky. And and there's totally black, black windows, you know, black helicopter with no markings on it, uh, clearly military. And I'm looking at them, and I'm sure they're checking me out with whatever equipment they had on board. And um, fortunately, I had the presence of mind to run into the house and grab a little, um, you know, sn- Point and shoot camera, and I grabbed a picture of them as they were leaving, just to just to prove to people, you know. I mean, it's sort of like that picture of the UFO I sent you. Okay, you know, I can say, oh, one showed up over my house. Yeah. Well, gee, how are you going to prove that? I mean, even the picture doesn't prove it, uh, but it helps. It helps. We know we're very visually oriented. Humans are, and um, you know, it, 
uh, I know people see them all the time. They're reporting seeing them all the time. What was so unusual about that was, that incident was, I had gone out the night before after doing a radio interview with someone about my, my investigation in Washington, D.C., and I was pissed off. I I mean, I was really frustrated. I'm like, and I said to them mentally, I'm like, are you guys crazy? Do you expect me? I'm nobody. Do you expect me to take on the, the, the powers that be in Washington, D.C.? You want me to expose that by myself? I mean, come on. I said, can't you give me a hand? And honestly, I wasn't expecting them to just magically do something. Okay, I'm not. Right. I'm not. In, I'm not crazy. I, I consider myself to be sane. I mean, I've gone through therapy for other things, and they they didn't say, "Well, you're insane. We need to lock you up." I, I live right. a normal. I live a normal life, folks. Honestly, if you came over to my house, you had a barbecue with me, you'd see I'm a normal guy. But I'm having a, a very, um, mm, extraordinary life. Anyway, uh, in some ways. Yeah. So. so <laughs> So what was the what was their answer? What was the answer? The very next morning, like twelve hours later, uh, I'm back out in the yard looking up at the sky. And except now it's a clear blue sky. It's daytime instead of night. And, and I'm watching this jet taking off behind my uh, to the just to the west of my house. There's a commercial airport, and I and I'm it was actually very low. It was doing something I'd never seen a jet do before around here, and um, uh, that caught my attention. And I'm looking at it, and it was. Uh, you know, pretty loud, very low, and it, but it was clearly taking off. And um, as I'm watching it, I saw behind it or above it was something that looked like Venus, but it was 10 o'clock in the morning, you know. I'd never seen that before. And after the, the jet had passed, I'm watching this thing, this star. I thought it was a planet, daytime star, and um, then I realized it was moving. And so I ran to I ran into the house as quick as I could, and I got my camera. It was a Nikon D80 at the time, with a good 200 millimeter lens on it. I come running back out as fast as I can to the same spot. Now it now this thing has moved to where it's positioned itself over my backyard, probably four or five hundred feet above the the house, mm-hmm. and it stopped. So I focused in on it and I took four pictures. They were all basically the same, but I was trying different settings. I lowered the camera to look, because I always shoot with manual settings. I lowered the camera just to look at the settings for a moment. I looked back up, and the object was gone. At least visually, it, I couldn't see it anywhere. And now, well, I, remember what I said? It was a clear blue sky. I, I'm over in New England. And, you know, I, it, When I mean sky is blue, it, it's there's nothing, not a cloud. It was, you could see right, yeah. miles in every direction. This thing was gone. Okay, so I'm and I'm thinking, wow, it, it, you know, how crazy is that? So um, I'm just trying to illustrate that sometimes they'll do things. I, I mean, for, hey, for all I know, that could have been the bad guys too. I mean, it's not like they they didn't get out, show me their ID, or you know, demonstrate anything <laughs> other than um, uh, by their actions. They uh, here's the thing: I know they heard me, they responded, and they didn't harm me. So. Right. I would have to say the next, you know, assumption on my part is that they were not the hostiles. Right. But I don't know what they're doing as far as, um, you know, um, r- helping to remedy the circumstances in Washington, D.C., per se. I know there's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of speculation. Um, and I try not to entertain that too much because, you know, it's it's not healthy. I mean, you would mentioned Ingo Swan. I read... I, I read that book, uh, Penetration, I think it was called. Yes. Man, that's a wild book. Yes, it is. You know, and yeah, here he's... made my he, head explode. Well, and that's why the the, the cover, that the illustration is very childish looking, but that, yeah, the person's head is all ballooned. <laughs> yeah, it, it does kind of make you feel like that. Um, but, I mean, you know, here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize there are... We can talk about reptoids and greys and clones and stuff, but... You know, my understanding is, and my dealings have been actually with humans uh, at times that are um, negative as well as positive. So, right. and, and I know we're related to them. I'm absolutely positive, based on all the historical evidence, that we are directly genetically, uh, you know, we're, we're <laughs> Homo sapiens are a direct result of genetic tampering or modification here on this world by other humans that are. In some ways, they're more advanced, but they're, you know, like I said, we're still related to them. 
the, and a lot of the reason for my understanding is that the, we're, we're, they're more advanced in a lot of ways is because they simply don't want us to compete with them. I mean, the bad guys don't, don't – they just want us to be their slaves. We're just um, property. Or lunch. Or, well, that now you're talking reptiles. Yeah, so – but I'm saying – the reason I well, mentioned the, the – grays, the grays, too. It's just one sure. different form. Right, 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 right. But my point is that a lot of times it's easier to focus on the um, adversaries that are not human. And the reason right. I'm the reason I'm bringing up the fact that there are there are evil human extraterrestrials in this universe and here on this world is because, as Bob Dean said, in, based on what he read in the NATO report, is that there are humans. They've known this that the, our military and obviously the Europeans that are part of NATO have known that uh, humans, extraterrestrial humans, are visiting this world, and they're indistinguishable from, from us. And the right. problem, that's, that's the group that scared them. Of all of them, that was the group that scared them because they said, you know, they could be anywhere. They could be here at NATO. They could be in the Pentagon. They could even be in the White House. Right. Right? So, and my point, you know, what the second book, what I came to the conclusion about Washington, D.C., is very uncomfortable. Sorry to say, a very uncomfortable conclusion, is that even if they're not physically walking around Washington, D.C. doing evil deeds, they have the ability, whether it is through technology or some advanced mind control technique that's biological, they can clearly in, uh, influence the, um, the, the, the thoughts and the behavior of a person remotely. Uh, the, ch the Catholic Church calls it possession, and it's been documented, and especially in Washington D.C. I give examples of that, and I'm just really sorry to say that's the case, but it is. So yeah. anyway, sorry to get off on that tangent. <clears throat> no, not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, and people should also be aware that a lot of things running around out there that they think are human are actually very clever holographically masked reptoids. Uh, yeah, or did you happen to see, did you look at all the photographs that I posted of Washington, D.C.? No. Uh, okay, because there's on page two, you probably missed page two, but there's a series of uh, collage of, um, composite of, uh, excuse me, a uh, series of photographs that were taken by my uh, journalism partner, uh, Will Allen, in Washington, D.C., a couple of years ago. He was standing there with a group of um, Washington, D.C. police officers and uh, near Howard University, and <laughs> this thing comes floating in, right? And my, my partner's always got a camera with him, so he took pictures of it. Well, it turns out it's, it's changing its shape. It's not a, it's not a bunch of balloons. It's not a UFO. It's it's an entity that is literally morphing as it moves through the air silently, and it's black. And it looks at – it has octopus-like appendages, but uh -huh. it, it, two or three weeks later, Victor Martinez put out a, um, a piece of information he claimed that was coming from his intelligence uh, operatives that he knows. And in this – Thing they're talking about how back in the 80s that they had captured one of these things, these creatures that can morph into the shape of a human, and that they've been covertly living among us. And this this one particular case. Now, and look, Victor sent this to me and about a, you know 200 other people, and he hadn't seen these pictures yet. So I I was floored when you know when <laughs> when that information came across my desk. I was like, oh, my God, this is a perfect description of what this, you know, these photographs are because they make no sense otherwise. In other words, you've heard this. You've, you may have heard this from other people that um, I understand, yes, sometimes they can do holograms, but there's apparently this one species that can actually um, shape shift or morph itself, its physical form, into that of a human, even though they're not human. So, I I, 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 you know, here's the problem with talking about this kind of stuff, John. Is I, it's not like I want to make people paranoid. I just want to help them to become more aware of the fact that um, things are not what they seem. <clears throat> and oh, as I was, absolutely. As I was telling the other caller, yeah. the the only reason I'm mentioning this is so that so mentally to prepare people a little bit better, acclimate them to these uh, these concepts, 
before they're they're faced with their in in undeniably faced with the reality that not only we're we not alone, but a lot of people that are living have been living on this world are, are not from here. Never, never were from here. Uh, yeah, well, I would agree with that characterization. Maybe. Uh, thing with the appendages and whatnot that you described reminds me of that aerial amoeba thing that Trevor Constable had a picture of in the Cosmic Pulse of Life. Oh, now you did it. Now you did it, John. Okay, so you probably have not read my press release about those things. Um, that would be one level of what the Gnostics call the Archons. It's a, uh, it's a Greek term. It simply means uh, ruler or lord. And the Gnostics had said long that we were invaded by these creatures long ago, one of them being reptilian, the other looks like an unformed human fetus. Some researchers have, uh, I think, mistakenly concluded that, that they were referring to the greys. <clears throat> but um, that's not, I, in my opinion, what they were actually talking about was the amoeba-like creature that you just des described. In fact, I, I'll have to send you the link because... It was a, a series, another series of events that happened after I finished writing my second book. Uh, uh, just very weird how it all came clicked in my mind. Apparently, the Gnostics in Greece and in uh, Egypt, and the Toltecs over in Central America were talking about the same thing around the same time. And so, uh -huh. through the through the writings of Carlos Castaneda, who you know alleged that he was you know in contact with this ancient uh, Toltec warrior. Uh, said that these things he called them the flyers, and that they that they were an, a foreign installation in our minds. In other words, that they could they were um, influencing us. That they he called them um, non biological. I don't know what uh -huh. exactly. I don't know what that means because they clearly influence us as though they are biological. And it, you can't, in my opinion, you can't photograph something that is not a. Uh, it's a living entity. Okay, I think it's very. Right. It's very much alive, and uh, they feed off of the negative energy that's generated by us when we have, um, you know, these these uh, dark emotions. Right. Would, right? So this is one of the reasons that they're constantly provoking us covertly to do harm to each other and ourselves, because that makes them stronger. It's, a, not, it's not only a food. Some people have likened it to a drug for them. Right. Okay. Yes, I, so I'm familiar with that, and there was okay. a famous Star Trek episode on that too. Yes, uh, you're going to in the original Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, I believe it was. yes, 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 yes. Are you talking about the Archons or the Amoeba thing? Well, it was the thing that fed on their negative energies. And yes, and it, yes. it was stirring up the Klingons against the Federation, and it was that was one of them. The Romulans and. Uh, you know, so I, yes. I'm very familiar with the concept of something that feeds on negative energy and horror and whatnot. So right. uh, things are constantly being set up so as to create the conditions that create the food. And somewhere I remember reading it was called the Louche. Yeah, that was Robert Monroe uh, who started the, the Monroe Institute for Remote Viewing. And uh, one of one of the entities that he allegedly contacted when he was doing these out of body um, uh, you know experiences that that entity spoke to him uh, at, about the fact that we were actually created for that purpose. Now I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I had to go back and read all that again um, recently. You know, it's like uh, look. Here's the thing. It's fine to uh, research this kind of stuff, but not all of it can be accurate. I mean, not everything is true. So how do That's how do you true. discern it? How does one analyze it in such a way that you can come to a, a, a really logical conclusion, or I should say one that's verifiably true as opposed to false, considering that we have very, you know, what do we have to work with, right? Right. That's, that's the biggest problem here. It's uh, we don't really have a Rosetta Stone that help us uh, decipher exactly what is a foundational truth because so much of our history has been taken from us, and and then other stuff was you know fabricated on top of that. I mean, this is one of the things the Gnostics said is that the Archons are masters of illusion, 
And this is one of the ways that they control us uh, for their own benefit. Well, I was talking to the ETVDs today about the Greys and how, as a result of a Nazi time travel experiment, they were able to get into the timeline. They went back some 11,000 years, and what they did was they basically meddled with a whole bunch of artifacts. And they right. put information on them that's false and created all kinds of things. Now, if they'd gone back, say, 12,000 years, they would have been massacred <laughs> by the benevolent ETVDs who were here. Yes, um, that's right. So they went back about as far as they thought they could safely go, given the limits of their transport technology, and apparently started putting out all kinds of disinformation, which has since become, uh, in a sense, almost holy lit in, in a bunch of different communities, uh, right. you know, that, that they altered the glyphs and the steels and, and all this other stuff and got certain wheels turning so that we think certain ways, and if you think in those ways, that self-limits your ability to develop mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, absolutely, because consciousness is mm, primary. This is this is one of um, the colleagues of Robert Monroe. It's a guy named um, Campbell. I think it's Tom Campbell. And he wrote uh, a book called My Big Toe, Toe being an acronym for a theory of everything. So he's one of the pioneers of digital <laughs> digital, I know, digital physics. Uh, is is new to this world, but it's ancient in in, in the sense of it um, uh, gives us a better understanding of how things operate. And I know I've said this before. Some people are probably going, oh, no, here he goes again. It, consciousness, in the, in the current model, Physics tells us that consciousness is just a random thing that 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 arises. It emerges. Okay, there's there is no <laughs> there's no uh, intelligence to any of this stuff. It's all just random mutations. And uh, eventually, if things work just right, consciousness appears. Uh, no, it's 180 degrees uh, different than that. In that, um, consciousness is what manifests everything. It is, and it is digital, and it is processed. In the sense that uh, it's it's all self-referential and it can be um, equatable, you know, it's processed it, each digit. It can be accounted for and uh, recorded. So, in other words, I'm talking about a virtual computer uh, that was manifested at who knows when. It's kind of irrelevant, but um, this we're in a virtual reality here, and I think a lot of people relate to that. Um, you know, the whole concept of the archons feeding off of our energy, that's exactly what the movie The Matrix was showing us in some very um, veiled terms. You know, they right. said, right, we were feeding the, the machines. Uh, because the archons are very um, unempathetic. They have no emotions like a machine. They are very mechanical in that regard. Um, so, uh, and that's what we do. We feed, we feed them uh, unawares. As long as we're in The Matrix here, we're feeding them with negative energy, or through our negative emotions, I should say, we're giving them sustenance. So, uh, but anyway, consciousness uh, is primary and it is digital, and so it, it can and it can take different phase states depending on you know its vibratory rate. Just like a, a drop of water can be either solid, a liquid, or a gas. A digit of consciousness can be either pure consciousness, can be energy, or it can be matter, and. And to, to be more specific, you know, we've been told that energy is matter, right? And it's constantly being converted from one back to the other, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. Well, yeah, not by us, not yet anyway, but it certainly can be. If somebody, something's creating it. You know, to say it was a big bang, you haven't answered the question. Where is it coming from? Why is it still coming? Why is it still manifesting? It's it's asinine to say that this is all just an accident. Yeah, you know. In fact, I know they. I know why the dark side is doing that because they really don't want us to see our true potential. They really don't want us to know that we are all gods. And when I say that, you know, I I don't. See, we're not God, the Creator, but these these the gods of our ancestors 
have the ability to create worlds. And they can do either through genetics or other things, but it really all comes down to consciousness. If you ha- if you don't know how to do this, if you have no conscious knowledge, you know, you can't do anything, right? You just be well, a vegetable. That's true. But th- this is known off planet as the planet of the gods. Right. Well, it, it, and yeah. this is the home of the human genome, the complete genome that mm. many of these star-faring groups have bred out of themselves. They bred emotion out of themselves, and now it's kind of like, oops, we're screwed because they've limited what they can do within the frameworks of their societies. Mm-hmm. But the human genome resides here. Earth is strategic. Uh, it is the linchpin of the whole galaxy. If Earth falls, it uh, opens up the entire galaxy to attack. So this is, you know, the grim reality, do or die time. But mm-hmm. the forces that are here, and there are more arriving all the time, have several specific missions, one of which is kill off the, the Dracos, the Reptoids, the Greys, mm-hmm. who are their hereditary enemies, uh, give humans a chance to develop naturally, destroy the NWO. Right. Okay, uh, for reasons both ordinary and extraordinary to include uh, some of the things that have been done to shoot down or crash victims, not from here. Um, Mm. You know, and this is what they do. And they also think it's a very good thing from the cosmic brownie point standpoint, the karmic thing, to go out and do these sorts of things. And when Mm. they get the cleaning house here, there are 20-some-odd worlds remaining that have to have the same process you know, they have to be cleared out. But people are going, well, why aren't they doing more here? And it's like, <laughs> these con- the conditions that obtain here on Earth are utterly unlike anything that's ever been seen in their entire history of operations of these sorts. Uh, yeah, and it's been well, going on uh, here. It's been going on here for thousands of years. This is the, these, the dark side is deeply entrenched here. It's not like they're just going to walk away. No, I mean... Uh, Layer after layer after layer, it's, it's like clearing a uh, gigantic booby-trapped onion. Mm. Now, there's lots of tears, but, uh, you know, things blow up in your face. Things that should work don't. Things that should work in a certain way. Uh, case in point, somebody tried to hit a target in California and something fell apart in New York as a consequence. Hmm. That's how disconnected things can get. Um, right. So, you know, you've got the problems associated with different groups operating in di- different dimensional levels facing unprecedented situations and trying to figure out how to coordinate all this, what it is that's, you know, not yielding the results. You know, I get a report that X, Y, and Z has been hit, and I get all excited, and I tell my contacts, and my contacts go charging forth and pull strings and call in favors and everything, so it's still there. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you mean it's still there? Well, it got destroyed on one timeline or whatever, but it never manifested in third-plane reality. So this Mm -hmm. causes consternation and confusion and upset on both ends. Yeah. Not to mention doing terrible things to my credibility and, (laughs) (laughs) you know, things like that. And this has happened many times, so many times that people have wondered whether I'm being conned by the liberation forces. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I've had to ask myself that question very seriously, but over the years I've learned that every time I go against my gut, I wind up with egg on my face. Mm -hmm. I don't like that as a decoration. (laughs) 
I tested and thought about this and meditated on it and everything, and I've concluded that they are who they say they are. They're doing what they say they're doing. They do not wish to be worshipped as gods. That's a gross insult. People don't want their agenda. Apparently, according to them, the notion of an agenda in the way we think of it, and I don't mean what's going to be discussed at the meeting. I'm talking in terms of the hidden agenda or right. secret agenda. Is yeah. a foreign concept to them. It apparently is something that is confined to Earth reality. Well, that things don't operate that way outside of here. Yeah, it, my understanding is, John, that this, as I said, was originally a colony that was set up by the good human extraterrestrials. And they were considered gods, but they weren't worshipped. They they brought the primitive life here up near to their standard, as near as they could, up until the time that the, this world was invaded and destroyed by the, the bad extraterrestrials who took over. And they designed a human uh, a Homo sapien that from the from the primitives, and uh, that was specifically designed to to be uh, inferior, and to, just to take orders, not to ask questions, not to live as long, not to be a comp a competitor, but more of a resource. So this is where the confusion comes in as far as you know. The gods of old are not all the same, and they're certainly not God the Creator. So everything has been tossed into a blunder. Again, the fog of war has has blinded so many over such a long period of time. It's a huge, huge uh, mess. You know, Gordian not trying to untangle it all. But oh, yeah. um, I do think that day is coming, John. I really do see it happening. Yeah, well, people go, well, when, when's the disclosure go? When's the government going to disclose? They're not. They can't. Dragged forth by the most tender parts of its anatomy <laughs> and not a day before. Uh, they can't. You know. here's, here's my opinion on that real quick, is they can't afford to be open about it because they will be implicated in the process, and none of them want that. And the other thing I was told when, you know, I mean, come on, we've got pictures of them landing on Capitol Hill in 2002, July. So, and, you know, when I contacted people like Podesta, who's, who runs that silly, uh, uh, he's got a lot of things going on in D.C., but he's, he's well connected, all right? And, I, you know, I, I, I said, hey, can you, can you guys help us get somebody to come on the record within, you know, your context should be, you know, I mean, you, I said mainly because you, I said you went to the press club and you said it's time for disclosure, right? Same year that All we right. got these pictures. You're out there later that year. You're saying well, it's time for disclosure. Okay, well, Mr. Podesta, we've got the pictures of them landing in Washington, D.C. Well, we can't, no, we can't get anybody. Nobody, nobody's going to come on the record. Well, why not? Because they, they don't want, they don't want to be held accountable Okay, <laughs> and now they didn't say his explanation was that first of all, this could cause panic. They still believe in that that outdated Brookings report from the fifties. Uh, uh, yeah. They're working from that model, that paranoid model. But they're also uh, not being honest with themselves. They're saying, well, you know, if somebody who was in the State Department or the Navy or whatever came forth and made a public statement and said, yes, UFOs are real, then they were going to be held accountable for doing something about it by the public. Now this is weird because this is this is not this is an unofficial policy that they have. They none of them want to be responsible for something that they think that they have no control over, which is is true to some extent. But but well, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. It's go ahead, what, to explain it to me. Has, well, the government killed hundreds, if not thousands, of people to keep the UFO secret. Okay, mm. for what? Okay. Uh, I've got an e-book pending in which a dozen people were killed to keep the secret. If you look at the history of the crashes going back to Roswell, there were mm. threats uh, to Jackie Rowe that she would be, uh, you know, taken so far out in the desert they'd never find her bones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got intimidation. You've got forced incarceration in mental hospitals. You have destruction of careers. You have destruction of people's finances. You have people driven mad, as in the Paul Benowitz case. Yeah. Uh, 
you have the black project financing is not, by and large, coming out of the federal budget. It is coming out of narco trafficking and gun running. Right. You know, the Ollie North type self financing off the shelf enterprises. Yeah. It is coming from uh, human slavery. It is coming from anything and everything that is awful and horrible. And anytime the CIA gets caught running drugs, it's always rogue elements. Well, my backside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and I say this as someone who very nearly went to work for the CIA as what they now call a field officer trainee. Okay. Uh, I'm very grateful I didn't. Yeah. Okay. But this is how they're paying for it. The underground tunnel network alone that people have written about with the maglev trains and the connections to all the labs and huge tunnels for moving the craft and things mm. of that sort, way over $40 trillion. Sure. Okay? The amounts of money that have been spent on the black program beggars description. Yeah. Uh, it just staggers the mind how much money has been spent and who's gotten rich on the contracts and whatnot. So there is so much evil, so much greed, so much embarrassment and humiliation over this. There has been enormous amounts of propaganda put out, uh, first to acclimate us to them on the one hand, and then when they realized that, you know, the forces of liberation were coming, well, now we've got falling skies, and we've got the Battle of Los Angeles, and, you know, and mm -hmm. we've got all these scenarios of fake alien invasion, right. which are designed to scare the populace, to poison the well of receptivity that would otherwise be there. You know, right. They used to have more than Mindy and Star Trek and blah, blah, you know, <laughs> Yeah, and right. Those, those were intended, especially Star Trek and some of the other things, to give humanity a sample of what awaited it. Mm -hmm. And we have been denied that. We have been denied that because free energy and anti-gravity are inextricably linked. And the people that control the utilities are the same people that control the uh, car companies by and large, are the same people that uh, control the airliners and things of this sort. And so they have no real incentive to screw up a system that works for them. So these things get suppressed. Uh, right. Ben Rich, who's the successor to Kelly Johnson at the Skunk Works at what's now Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. said that anything you can imagine, we've done already. Right. That's a pretty shocking declaration coming from, you know, the quintessential military aerospace insider. And he said that we have the pro you know, we have the technology that could provide the clean energy and all this stuff. But it's locked up in black programs, and it would take, I don't even think you believed an act of Congress would get it out. Right. Okay. So, but the people are bucking a historical tide. There is going to be disclosure, whether they want it or not. And the reason that I can say that with confidence is I'm part of that process. There are a bunch of pissed off people with high level access who are sick and tired of being lied to by their own governments who are coming forward and sharing information that hmm, causes a condition, and I'm going to be slightly indelicate here, but the acronym for it is ID, and it stands for instant diarrhea. And we joke <laughs> among ourselves about, you know, buying stock in d -pen. 
Mm-hmm. Because when you put out information, say, that, you know, S4 has been raided and the following craft have been taken, well, the security types lose their mind and some other things, too. Mm. You know, that information is so closely held that the President of the United States is not privy to it. It takes a presidential clearance to get on to Area 51. The President can't visit Area 51. And there are 20-some-odd levels of clearance above what it takes to get on Area 51, if my right. memory's right. And it's probably off by 10 or something or more. Mm-hmm. So people have no idea what is being withheld from them. Right. But suffice it to say that I would not want to be a science fiction writer. (laughs) The weaponry that exists right now is like something out of, you know, we write at home in Star Wars, okay? Mm -hmm. the, The weaponry that the ETZDs can bring to the fray and certain kinds which they may or may not elect to pass on to their allies are even beyond that. Wow. In some cases, okay, they have the ability to take down whole societies with the throw of a single switch. So wow. that's, that's why it's a good idea to listen to them when they make pronouncements. Uh, Look at what happened to Israel when it didn't pay attention on the matter of the uh, ballistic missile submarine it was sending to Iran. Warning after warning was issued. Israel didn't listen. There was a bad storm. The crew men and the sub had to surface because the storm racked the sub so badly. A crewman got a depressed skull fracture. He's probably the only survivor of the sub, and the sub mysteriously was crushed above its crush depth. Hmm. When the Chinese got a hydrographic vessel on the scene, they photographed the wreck. The wreck was missing its missile compartment, exactly as the EZDs said they do. They weren't going to leave the missiles down there for anybody else to get or to contaminate the ocean further. And there was a gaping hole in the side of the hole where the reactor compartment should have been. Mm. Okay? Yeah. They disappeared 40-some-odd kamikaze boats in the Persian Gulf when they were in the middle of an attack on the tankers. One instant they're there, the next instant they're gone. This was seen by the merchant ship crews, the merchant ship captains, the naval escorts from several countries. It was tweeted widely and everything, and that whole incident was made to go bye-bye. The government simply went over to Twitter and demanded all the tweets be removed. That was the evidence of what had happened. Right. Okay, this is what you're up against. Okay, the technologies, you know, we've got, you know, 90-mile-an-hour freight train, and the bullet train makes 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, the Shinkansen. Yeah, but with maglev technology, you can run at a significant fraction, I believe, of Mach 1 in an evacuated deep underground tunnel. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. There's anti-gravity. There's been anti-gravity since the 30s. There's been cold fusion or what they call low-energy nuclear reactions. The uh, Office of Naval Research got work underway on that in the 20s. The average person doesn't have a clue. In 1922 or thereabouts, Nikola Tesla went to a radio shop, came got a handful of parts, some wires and whatnot, and came out and converted his Pierce Arrow to free energy <laughs> in a matter of minutes. Yeah. yeah. And it's a matter of public record that Firestone and GM conspired to destroy the Red Line, which was the mass transportation rail network for Los Angeles, so that they could get their cars and asphalt highways and you know rubber and everything else in there. Mm. 
So, you know, we've had clean energy technology for a very long time. We've had anti-gravity technology for a very long time. The Germans were flying operational craft during World War II, for example. Right. Uh, and I've seen pictures of some of their World War II designs over Oregon in 67. Um, you've got all sorts of technologies that have been seeded into the society. If you read uh, Corso's The Day After Roswell, he talks about how he was passed by his boss, who was head of Army on D, General Trudeau, to go around and seed the Army's share of the Roswell craft take. And it included what they called super tensile fabrics, what we call Kevlar. Mm-hmm. It included fiber optics. It included thermal imaging systems. And the companies were to be allowed to, quote, discover and patent these things themselves. So these things are out there, but the things that would really be the game changers are not out there by and large. You know, you've got the B-2, which is an anti-gravity craft. You've got the TR-3B Astra, which is, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a pure anti-gravity craft, but certainly a gravity-reduced craft. Mm -hmm. You've got... You know, the SR-71, they took the SR-71 out of service, and then they said, oh, my God, you know, we're not getting enough coverage. And it's like, I knew perfectly well they would never retire the SR-71 without having something in its place, and that was the so-called Aurora, which they changed the name of, I'm sure, as a result, and is now called Enterprise, which doubtless hmm. confused people who think in terms of the space shuttle, and I've written on that. These are the kinds of things that give intelligence people apoplexy. Point revealed. Mm. Okay. Uh, you've got craft that can fly at speeds that are just incomprehensible to the average person. Um, there's a space show mission, I, I want to say 46, I could be wrong. Mm. But there was a weapon fired out of Russia. Uh, might have even been the Soviet Union, and I'm a little hazy on the time, at a craft in orbit over the Earth. And it was calculated that the craft evaded what was fired at it, and it was clearly moving way too fast to be a missile, so it had to be an energy weapon of some sort. Mm -hmm. It was calculated the craft pulled 14,000 Gs. Good. now, let me put that in perspective for you. 9 Gs hurts a lot. Right. 14 is the pretty much the instantaneous limit for the human body. Right. This thing pulled a 14,000 G maneuver to get out of the path of this energy pulse that was fired at it. Mm. Okay. And that's possible because the craft is... Gravity in the craft is internally referenced to the craft, so it doesn't yeah. matter yeah. what you do. Uh, you know, and this was discussed by Herman Obert back in the '60s, mm-hmm. the great human rocket scientist. So, where we are with our perceived technology versus where we really are is the difference between night and day. And in the meantime, you know, it's like we'll build F-18s or whatever. But meanwhile, there's a one-man anti-gravity fighter that will, you know, turn square corners and uh, zip, zip, zip and go any direction it wants. But you won't sell any F-18s if people know you have something better. So... You build these things and you sell them and you convince people that's how it is and it keeps the whole conventional petroleum-based economy scenario going and things of that sort. Meanwhile, you've got these special toys that you keep for occasions like the Gulf War where a craft sits up there and demolishes everything in sight and turns military formations, tanks and men alike, into black goo on the desert floor as attested by a Marine general who confiscated video from his troops of exactly that. Mm. You know, this 
is the reality of where the technology is. Okay, they can make things disappear. They can um, get to people in ways that would beggar description. Uh, They can change memory files in your head. They can alter your perceptions of reality. There are even, so help me, classified drugs Hmm. that do various things, one of which will turn you into a sex addict. And unless you get the drug regularly, it starts to really wreck your body. So the difference between what the public perceives as real and true and possible and what is really real and true and is being done Mm. is staggering. It's just staggering. Uh, You know, we've had teleportation, not being the up Scotty type thing, but artificial wormhole technology that has taken us to the moon and Mars, although we're not welcome on Mars, it was reconquered by the Orionites in 89, according to what the EPZDs have told me, but we used to go to Mars. Um, you can transport Amazing things, amazing distances, if you know what you're doing. There are weapons that would rival anything in uh, certainly anybody's notion of Flash Gordon-type weapons or anything along those lines. It'll burn through anything. There are disruption and disintegration technologies out there. The Germans demonstrated a disintegration weapon in 1944. Wow. You can read about it in one of Joseph Farrell's books. Uh, I forget which one. I think it might be Wreck of the Black Sun. Mm. Okay. A disintegration beam. 200 rats turned into organic goo. In 1944, the Germans demonstrated what was apparently what they call a grazer or gamma ray laser in 45 in a quarry. Uh, the skipper of the U-977 was invited, this is one of the subs that turned up four months after the war in Argentina, Mm -hmm. was invited by an SS buddy to the test of a death beam, but couldn't go because he had to get his sub ready to go to sea. Hmm. You know, so I maintain that if you don't know where the tech base was in World War II, you have a prayer of understanding where it is now. Right. Yeah. No. And if the tech base in World War II was already beam weapons, operational anti gravity craft, even if they were conventionally armed and they were mm-hmm. if the tech base uh allowed off planet communication and the Germans were using telepaths, that's very well recorded. Uh mm-hmm. well, where are we now? Yeah. We are so far beyond that, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing people don't understand, that this has been going on for thousands of years. World War II is just an extension of the, the, the technology and the modus operandi of the dark side. Uh, and then that, that would include humans, extraterrestrial humans that are evil, um, and, and have been for long before they arrived here. I mean, this is this is just what they are. I mean, they established a, an empire. When you're talking about the 20 planets... Uh, you know, I was re- that was really unpopular when I first mentioned that there was an evil empire that ruled not only uh, off-world, but on-world. You know, when I first made that declaration publicly, it's like, guess what, UFOs landed on Capitol. By the way, uh, I'm sorry to say that, you know, the Earth is is ruled by, you know, negative extraterrestrials, and that's why we're, we're not getting a straight answer. <laughs> that was that was a very unpopular thing to say back in... Um, uh, December 2006, when I got on the radio nationally and put that out there, like, oh, my God. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'm sure it went over like the proverbial lead balloon. Well, but, especially well, with certain people. You know, it's, look, some people are open-minded or or just know these things to be true. Um, right. And then, you know, other people, this is their, their, 
confused by it and they just dismiss it uh, or or they feel threatened and they, they they you know they get angry with me you know like you're going to hell or something you know uh <laughs> for saying this you know um but I, you know what keeps crossing my mind John is what compelled you to come forward the last year what was it well it was a combination of things um uh... I've been pretty bashed around in my life, and uh, I have some health conditions that have sidelined me from the regular workforce, basically, and um, I was looking for something to do, and one of my close friends pointed out to me that I'd written all these articles for Atlantis Rising, and Mm -hmm. wasn't really getting much out of them. I mean, uh, when Doug Kenyon started putting out the Forbidden series, Forbidden History, Forbidden Religion, Forbidden Science, you know, I got included in, well, I would have been in all three, but the the way it worked out was the middle volume, my story was just too out of phase thematically with where they were going there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, that was a case where the money certainly came in handy and it was very gratifying to be in print, but the big money wasn't really being made on my end or anything. And I had the copyright from these 50 cutting-edge articles. So we said, well, why don't we build a site and do it right, figure out how to use all our marketing acumen. We've done all kinds of marketing things over the years. Mm-hmm. And what we will do is we will build a really high quality site, to drive traffic to it, and sell your ebooks and uh, work it out from there. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I started out to do when I was writing this stuff. The next thing I know, um, some contacts that I'd had years and years prior, where I went with somebody who used to make these outrageous pronouncements that frankly made me wonder if she was nuts, (laughs) many times, not just once, uh, invited me to a channeling session. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't for me. I just kind of sat in on it. You know, I was just there. And what I noticed, much to my surprise, is that I could hear the other side of the conversation, and I could occasionally get a glimpse of who she was talking to. And I wow. went, whoa. <laughs> that, that got my attention, and then it kind of built up from there. Uh, so that was, you know, a pretty exceptional experience. And I got wrapped up in all kinds of things that, ultimately led to my coming out here. I just kind of disintegrated across the board. Everything fell apart. Hmm. So I went through a long period of repairs to various kind of damages and things. And, you know, in order to be, I think, a telepath, you've got a lot of other sensitivities that come with it mm-hmm. as long as you are. Um, you know, fluorescent lights and lunar and solar and earth sensitivity and being able to sense what's going on inside the planet, things of that nature. Uh, And it just kept getting worse and worse. The more of these things you feel, the more debilitated you get. um, So there's that dynamic. But what changed the whole game for me was I started out, you know, I mean, certainly I was interested in all those things that it indicates on my blog. But I find myself all of a sudden in a situation where, first of all, I'm getting this super high-grade intelligence information. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I start hearing from the off-planet side. I was like... Uh, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? And I discovered that I have what I'm told is a pretty rare gift, even among the ETZDs, which is the ability to communicate by telepathy interdimensionally. Hmm. And so I got kind of, you know, as they're here to liberate the planet, I got kind of sucked into that and everything it entails. And so it 
you know, I got a few cryptozoology posts done, and I've gotten some stuff on black project technology done, but a lot of the black projects involve the ETED type technology. Um, you know, samples include things like uh, the prototype for what became the F-117, the Hal Blue, the B-2, mm -hmm. the Enterprise, um, to name just a few. So these things started to blend together, but more and more and more it became about the ETs, EDs, and what they had to say, and the actions and uh, plans and whatnot of the New World Order, and almost everything else has gone by the boards as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And as certain other information has come my way, like the very controversial Ascension corrections, if you would, and things of that nature. I mean, I've written on those, but in part, it was because things were jammed up upstairs and they couldn't conduct operations because of some of these problems I've described. So I had to write about something. Uh, but the day is fast approaching when the barriers to operations are going to collapse and things are going to begin in earnest. And the scope and scale and the ferocity of what is going to be directed against the dark forces on this planet is going to leave people slack-jawed in stupefaction. Right. I mean, they're already doing things like shooting down chemtrail aircraft, but you're talking about a force where a single ship has the firepower to destroy the planet. So what chance do you think the NWO realistically has? Yeah. You know, I wrote a while back about how an anti-UFO targeting system was destroyed off Sakhalin in Russia, and uh, crews, crew members who survived, all the specialists were killed, by the way, but the ordinary Ivans, if you would, uh, survived. But they described it as though a giant hand made of water rose from the ocean out of nowhere and just smashed the thing. Whoa. Okay. Something very similar happened to that Israeli ballistic missile sub, the Boomer. Mm -hmm. They just crushed it. They took the crew off, which was awfully nice of them, but they crushed it. They uh -huh. snatched a B-2 right out of the air on takeoff. It was flight lead in an arrowhead formation. Wow. Big green flash, poof, no B-2. Huh. Uh, one of those triangular anti-gravity craft that I described, a little one-man anti-gravity fighter that Lockheed builds. Uh, you know, the maintenance crew at Holloman Air Force Base, broke for lunch, came back, and it was gone. Mm. Well, craft that we'd spent millions to recover from places like Norway and various other parts of the world, you know, vanished um, from the most highly secured areas you can imagine. Right. Well, I guess for... Uh, they've snatched documents, they've done all kinds of things, and that's just the warm-up act. Wow. Hmm. That is just the warm-up act. The, the determination they have, the love and respect they have for humankind and innocent human life, you know, when I wrote about strikes are about to begin or whatever, I got an email from somebody going, you know, who probably thought I was talking about flattening whole cities. No. Mm -hmm. They they make precision strike look like uh like the Americans are incompetent at it. Yeah. They can tailor effects to create all kinds of things. And there are things that are appearing, for example, as earthquakes that are really 
according to my understanding, destruction of vast underground military bases packed full of lovely things like reptoids and greys or super soldiers or whatever. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. you get into situations like that, but you know, until you get into things that the public can see, you got a real problem with credibility. If sure. it's not on the news, they tend not to believe it. If they can't see it with their own eyes, you got a problem. And that's why people have been screaming for what you've doubtless seen referred to as lawn darts, where you take a submarine and you drop it in the ground point first, you know, leave a couple hundred feet of it sticking out in the air, or drop them in various bodies of water where they couldn't possibly ever get. Right. Uh, things of that nature. But those are what the ETZDs characterize as pony shows. The yeah. primary mission is smash the living daylights out of the whole dark force structure. Wreck it utterly. Yeah. Destroy it completely. Yeah, because you know, John, I think there's a danger if too many people wake up too soon, they could become targets um, to the dark side as because they are desperate and becoming increasingly so. Uh, at least some, what I've yeah. observed. Well, that, that, that's absolutely true, and that's my considered opinion. If I tried running this blog the way I've been running it, I would have lasted two weeks had I tried this a year ago. I see. If that. Right. If that. You know, I've gotten threats of people that would talk in intelligence circles about, well, when are we going to lance that boil? That's the reason <laughs> for killing me. Yeah. Um, you know, now their official viewpoint is that, you know, I'm a nut job and not a threat. But I bet you dollars to donuts that I'm on a whole bunch of watch lists. Yeah. You know, so uh, I really don't know right now whether I could go get on an airplane and fly anywhere. Apparently, they're definitely afraid I'll leave the country and really do damage hmm. like outside of their jurisdiction, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I'm really trying to do is get out as much truth as I can, avoid the disinformation traps to the greatest extent possible, remind people that, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. You know, that everybody can do something. And it varies from person to person. With one person, it may be meditation. With somebody else, it may be some psychic power. With somebody else, it may be the ability to get the word out on the Internet. Somebody else may be a tweet maven. You just never know. Right. And some people are gifted healers. There's, there's some very fantastic healers. Um, you know, like even Uri Geller didn't really have that ability until he'd had contact with the benevolence. There's another guy in Israel also who became a fantastic uh, uh, biologically gifted healer after having, uh, he was gifted by the benevolence. So right. the, the reason I bring that up is because they're try constantly trying to uh, poison us and, um, uh, you know, disrupt our ability to evolve. And that's something that I think people are going to, you know, this, this right now they're talking about health care. Obviously, you don't need 2,700 pages to reform health care. This is very draconian. It's just another way of oh, 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 controlling. Or a microchip in your vaccine. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very, very sinister. But I'm saying, the reason I'm bringing it up is because a lot of people don't understand. There's, I don't just mean holistically. I'm talking about the level of health that we could obtain or attain in the future is much like we're talking about free energy. Running cars and or any transform transportation be safer, smarter, faster, cleaner. <clears throat> our our consciousness and our level of health is going to be a, at a phenomenal pl place. I mean, beyond what most people can even you know imagine right now. Right. Yeah. Well, our fundamental perceptions have been altered through every kind of mind control imaginable. 
yeah. substances in the food, uh, especially the heavily processed stuff that make us susceptible to electronic mind control. Yeah. Uh, orbital mind control satellites, even though that sounds like the ravings of a lunatic, but they mm. really do exist and uh, are attested to by the former equivalent of the Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Ron Akilda of Finland, who says that basically the human brain can't keep up with the information loads some of these systems can induce. Right. I can run two microwave frequencies that will generate a beat frequency, and I can talk to you in your head. Right. And I can make you believe pretty much anything I want you to believe. Uh, that technology, uh, yeah, and that technology for humans that they well, we've acquired that a while ago. Uh, it was called a neurophone, and it, it, you actually put on a device to do it, and then it became wireless. And yeah, I, I followed all that technology. It's it's really insidious, you know. We, we shouldn't be doing that to each other. Obviously, if we were sane, or if, uh, if we weren't being um, manipulated by the dark side, we wouldn't do these kind of things. Yeah, and there's a. Uh... There are lots of other ones, too. You, know, you can yeah. do floating driving. You can do subliminal. There was a big stink about that. Trust me, they're still doing them. Uh, yeah, the, the psychotronics, I know. Uh, Bearden, uh, Tom Bearden had written a lot about that back in the day. Yes, a truly, truly impressive intellect. I had the good fortune of hearing him, meeting him, reading many of his books. So as far as I'm concerned, he's the towering intellect of the era. I think in many ways even beyond Dr. Stephen Hawking. Mm. Uh, wow. The man is just phenomenal. And he's so disarming, too. He go, he looks like Dom DeLuise, and he goes around. <laughs> and Guaya Barrett, he says, like the Cajuns say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he can quote you chapter and verse out of the most obscure physics papers in Russia, mind you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, just really go to town. His mind is unbelievable. I walked out of a session many, many years ago feeling like my brains had dissolved and run out of my ear canal. <laughs> it was just that overwhelming. Uh, yeah. But we stand on the threshold of perhaps the greatest change in the history of humankind. Mm -hmm. you know, the reptoids have held us down for tens of thousands of years, if not millions, depending upon whom you ask and how, how great your tolerance for reality is. Mm -hmm. And they have specifically been to damp evolution, and they've done an absolutely brilliant job of it. And they would typically let a society get built up, and then they would destroy it, and it would start over again. And the proof of that pudding is found in things like gold chains and, you know, Permian layers mm -hmm. of coal. It's found in spark plugs and geodes. And recently, uh, there was a piece that went around about a 400 million year old machine. Wow. Uh, preliminary results on it indicate that it is much like the Antikythera device, which in relative terms happened yesterday. The Antikythera device could calculate feasts and astrological alignments and things like that. They yeah. think it's something like that. But this thing is 400 million years old. Wow. Let, let me put that in perspective for the listeners. Virginia Steen McIntyre was a highly respected geologist who was brought in to date a Clovis site. Uh, Clovis well, you, you would have said Indian, but I guess you could say Native American site in Mexico. Right. Uh, she dated it six different ways. The conventional wisdom was that the Clovis culture went back 20,000 years. She dated it to 
200,000 years. Mm. Now, many of her colleagues agreed with her privately, but she was sacked and wound up running a flower shop. Okay? Right. So if the Clovis culture goes back 200,000 years, now we're talking about a complex, multi-layered, precision-geared machine that's 400 million years old. Mm. I, well, I think we're we're way back there somewhere. Um, my timing, my sense of time is bad. So off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you when the Neanderthal was running around. But you are talking about levels of civilization, levels of technology that are flatly impossible by conventional archaeological standards. Yeah, actually, John, I, I was, uh, for the novel that I'm writing, I was going through that timeline recently, and um, um, I think it, Neanderthal didn't even exist. We were still, or the life forms here were still the Homo erectus, you know, basically an ape man at that time. So there's no way that what, they did that. that. Two million years ago, or something like that. I, it was a yeah, two four two four whatever. There was a period of millions of years where there was just a very primitive uh, man creature that was here. That uh, like I say, they you know they were keeping it. The good guys, these builders, as Ken calls them, they they were um, looking around and caring for the. Uh, uh, they like I said, they develop things like, almost like gardeners, you know, landscapers. They go around, they do stuff to uh, keep an eye on the creation, make sure that it's going away uh, certain ways, you know. But it, my understanding is that this was originally a reptilian planet. Obviously, the the, the fossil record shows us that. And um, you know, Sagan had said that if they had if they had survived, there would have been a, a humanoid version of that. And oh, I've, you, seen, I've seen th that model, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty freaky. I mean, how did he know that? <laughs> I don't know. But, but yeah, I, yeah. Have, I have seen the model. My brother got to see it at a museum, was kind enough to send me a snapshot of it. Yeah, and, it, it's and not a kind of... I've heard it argued that they were deliberately targeted, you know. Yeah. You, yeah. You're talking about stellar cultures that have the ability to play drop the rock with asteroids. Right. Okay? Yes. Yeah. You're talking about the ability to terraform in ways that are inconceivable to people. You're talking yeah. about yeah. telekinetic powers. You're talking about telepathy being uh, ordinary telepathy being routine. Uh, I know of a case where Somebody was, uh, a family was picnicking in Oregon and whatnot, and one of the kids wandered away while they were getting set up. And he comes to a kind of a ravine, he looks down in the ravine, and there's a bunch of witches and a pentagram, and they're conjuring something. Well, what mm -hmm. they conjure is a reptoid. Oh, boy. So, the kid, uh, in the meantime, has gone herring off. You know, he hasn't seen the reptoid. He saw the witches doing something and thought that was interesting. So he went and gets his family, or goes and gets his family, and uh, they're standing on the lip of the ravine watching this. The reptoid gets conjured up. All of a sudden, all the witches turn around and look up at the family in unison. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, the reptoid comes flying out of the ravine in one leap, and the people describe having this thing, it felt like it was using their brains as a Rolodex. It was going through their memory files, and it was assessing on the fly whether they were a threat. It didn't hurt any of them. Hmm. But that's the kind of mental power you're talking about. Yeah, it goes back to what I said before about consciousness. That the uh, there's there's examples where of, um, highly evolved beings, including humans, that can manifest things seemingly out of thin air. But what they're doing is converting consciousness to energy to matter. It's it's 
And yeah, well, like uh, Sai Baba could do that. That's uh, allegedly, that's, yeah. The, well, I, that the booty the thing. You know, look, look, yeah, John. The, the booty I, thing. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with that. I my my dad was a minister at the Self Realization Fellowship with Yogananda, so I I started the metaphysical journey when I was a child, and I'm fifty something now. So, <laughs> you know, I've been around the block um, in this regard. Uh, it doesn't make me infallible though. But um, anyway, so uh, I'm just saying there's examples though of people who allegedly can do these things. And I believe them to be true. Actually, in Yogananda's uh, autobiography, he talks about um, uh, Babaji uh, supposedly manifesting an entire palace in the Himalayas uh, for him to demonstrate. I mean, this beautiful golden, gilded, uh, jewel bestudded, uh, you know, um, glowing palace. And he says the whole thing was was manifested by Babaji's consciousness simply to show him the power of consciousness. Um, right. You know, it wasn't an illusion, by the way. I mean, the way he described it, he says it was. It felt. It felt physically. It was as real as anything else in our physical domain. Sure. Uh, you know. So again, these. This is what we're being. This is our true potential. We are, uh, as it says in the Bible, ye, ye are our gods, uh, but we are not. Um, huh. We're in the. We're sort of like in the standby mode. We're not we're not accessing that true potential uh, yet. It's and and that was again. It's all done deliberately. You know, as part in some ways, it's a test. I guess uh, if you if you want to look at it more of an esoteric way, but um, in, in in any regard, we are being blocked, prevented from um, moving to that next level of being where we can actually manifest these things uh, for ourselves and for each other in you know in a, in a very loving, creative way. Um, uh, so, boy, it's it's a really exciting times that we live in. Even though it's extremely frustrating uh, to be here. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, if I'm so powerful, why am I so helpless? Is uh-huh. a uh, uh-huh. recurring refrain from my end. Uh, yeah, you know uh, the kind of experiences to be able to talk to these beings, and then you have some of these sobering conversations where it's kind of like, well, you know, we're looking at how our creation has progressed. What? Yeah. (laughs) And our ally is the X here, and we've been allied with the X for, you know, hundreds of years, and that's why they're so good at Y. Mm -hmm. Oh... You know, well, what do you think, given that you live in the same country as I do? Well, you know, um, that's not where my loyalty lies, you know. Yeah. Because you're dealing with beings that, you know, may be walking and talking in 3D bodies, but, uh, you know, (laughs) aren't necessarily from here. Uh, I've never felt I belong here. Yeah. I always felt I got locked down the wrong chimney, as it were. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I've had some confirmation recently that I'm not really from here. Uh, so, you know, you've got a lot of people who uh, took on Earth embodiment to be here at this time. Many, 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 many have been lost one way or another, they get right. wrapped up in the day-to-day stuff, they forget who they are, they never get properly activated. I would yeah. say the attrition numbers are 90% plus wow. in that regard. Okay, But there are still others who are here, who are awake, who are taking action. We have the off-planet contingent, which is growing by in strength by the day and awareness of what it's like to operate here. Mm-hmm. And the day is fast approaching when the celestial hammer is coming down, and it's coming down hard. Now, I thought, and you can see it in some of my posts, that it was going to come down a lot sooner than it did, but it turned out paradoxically that many of the things that were done were counterproductive. They were traps that were laid, and all they did was accelerate the other side's movements. Wow. That was not a happy day for anybody on either end. Right. 
now, then you've got all these idiots going around trying to create the end times. <laughs> Netanyahu, for example, has said he wants to be the last prime minister of Israel. you got the ultra-right Muslims who are busy trying to bring about the return of the Mahdi, and of course the Christians are looking for the second coming, so right. everybody's trying to create the conditions for that. Well, this isn't exactly helping the process of liberating the planet, because no. the liberation forces have to hive off so many resources to keep the village idiots from burning down the town, so to speak. Right. Yeah, no. I, under, I understand no. the complexities, John. It's not just logistics. There's a there's a complexity here that is it's an absolute conundrum. I mean, oh, tough it is, stuff. and there's tough. a lot of issues related to sequencing. And if you get things out of the wrong sequence, things just grind to a complete halt, mm -hmm. as they have repeatedly. People are going, "Why don't they do X?" Well, they would if they could. Or sure. if they weren't busy tied up dealing with some other crisis, some genius fomented. Yeah. And I use genius in the extreme ironic sense of the word. Yeah, evil genius. Well, if you like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So people, you know, want razzle dazzle and great displays and all this stuff, and they seem to think that the ETVDs are you know, seals of dolphins who are supposed to perform on command. It doesn't work that way. No, not at all. So they're free sovereign beings. We're very fortunate to have them. Right. And we wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell without them. Right. The technology disparity that the government slash shadow government has over the citizenry is astronomic. I'm told there's even technology to jam up firearms. Uh, hmm. You know, uh, yeah. there are so many things that they do. I mean, a real simple one is that Almost every municipality's water is fluoridated, but very few people realize that fluoride was used by the Germans in the concentration camp water, yeah. specifically to keep the inmates docile. Yeah, and that's and it, not all they're putting in your water either. Oh no, no, no! They they found all kinds of drugs and perchlorate uh, chemical, uh, you know, residual stuff. Uh, not to mention all the nuclear radiation and. Yeah, it's it's intense. It's intense, you know. But in specifically the fluoride, what it does is it calcifies the uh, the um, third eye. The pineal gland is something that um, uh, it's another way of us seeing into not only the other dimensions but connecting to these uh, the source. And uh, uh, so that, of course, you know, that's not allowed. Oh well, no, you can't have them waking up and realizing they're more than you've been telling you. Uh, more than you've been telling them they are. Right. You know, they would get out of control. And we have yeah. proven to be a fractious uh, race for a very long time. And every time they think they've got us neutered, we turn out not to be. Well, and they're, they're bucking the tide of history now. I mean, the planet shall, will, is and must be liberated, and uh, it's just going to happen. And, yeah. uh, you know, the other side's going to put up a very determined fight, has put up a very determined fight, is mm -hmm. willing to press on despite enormous losses. Yeah. The, the five motherships cost the reptoids something like three-quarters of a million of their kind. I know they, but they because part of the problem is not just the reptiles, the humans too. They don't value the evil ones. Do not value life. No, that's that's the problem with them. So it's they, it's difficult. That's one. It, it just makes things really complicated. And uh, yeah, um, so. I hope that uh, we can keep in touch and have you back. I, I have no idea if the if the sh you know it, how the show was recorded. I've I've never heard this quite this much interference before. Uh, all night long, I'm I'm hearing these clicks and and echoes and 
you know, the levels are apparently off when people are listening. So hopefully the recording's fine. If you know, um, uh, but either way, I would like to have you back on another time to discuss, uh, give us some updates, and uh, continue the conversation. I'd love to. Be happy to make myself available. I've had a ball. I love doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, well, um, yeah, you've been a great guest, and I certainly appreciate what you're doing. I, I know it's difficult, and uh, but uh, it's it it's serves a purpose, a greater uh, purpose. Yeah. yeah, it does. I would encourage people, who, especially those who have no familiarity with my blog, to come to johnkettler.com, the book that... Uh, Robert mentioned earlier that details the story of the Vimana in Afghanistan is available there. We will shortly have another one out uh, that covers a crash recovery in which a bunch of people were murdered to keep the secret, but the story is absolutely stunning, even by normal UFO standards. <laughs> stunning. Wow, that's, well, that's saying something. It is. Yeah. Yeah, they, I know people people use this to cliche that the truth is stranger than fiction. But I got to tell you, after studying, uh, investigating Washington D.C. for six years, I have learned that that is absolutely reality. Truth is oh, yeah. much stranger than fiction. In fact, it's much stranger than we can even imagine in some cases. I would not want to be a science fiction writer right now. <laughs> I just would. I mean, it's like, well, the the, the stuff. Um, some years ago, I think it was probably somewhere around 1990, a guy named um, I think it was Nick Baker wrote War in 2020. Now, all the things he describes as War in 2020 are, I mean, they've been in service for years, <laughs> they decades. Like, yeah. yeah. You know, maybe you should have called it War in 2010. Yeah. True enough. All right, John. Thanks again for coming on the show, and uh, we'll keep in touch. My pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.